Assalamu alaikum everybody. Um, finally, we're back. Uh, another arena, mashallah. Um, you know why the last one was cancelled. Um, so anyway, so here we go again. Inshallah. So uh, the arena, for anyone who doesn't know, um, it's a platform for non-Muslims. Now, the key word here is non-Muslims. Um, to come and either challenge Islam directly. So come and tell us why they don't believe Islam is true or challenge some of the teachings or whatever it may be. Or they may come on teach us that Christianity is true, which makes Islam false by default. Or they might be atheists and want to come, come and talk about sky daddies. Um, whatever, whatever it is. Uh, so that that's the that's the platform. Um, it's, it is called the arena. Um, we are a bit rough and ready. Well, I can can be. Um, we're not shrinking violets here, so um, you know we don't mind who's coming on. Um, I don't think apostate parasite is going to get on today, though. To be honest with you. Um, anyway, let me introduce the gladiators who are going to be helping deal with the today's guests. So, returning, mashallah, is our brother Sharif from the Thought Adventure podcast. Salam alaikum, Ahi. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Oh, Jazakallah khair, Hamza. Oh, right, well, on. Honestly, I'm so happy to hear you agreed to come on, man. I just love the way, the clarity that you give, mashallah. Jazakallah khair. And then we got Brother Hashim from Dawa Wise, Alhamdulillah, mashallah, to deal with all the Trinitarian claims, uh, Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum, bro. Alhamdulillah, how are you guys doing? Alhamdulillah. And we've also got, making his debut, Daniel Hakikachu. Did I say that right? I've been practicing, yes. man. Great, excellent. Assalamu <laughs> alaikum, guys. Very happy to be here. Jazakallah khair. The, the, the crowd is so excited to, mashallah, uh, have you in the house. So, uh, alhamdulillah, let's hope we get some worthy uh, contestants. And the final gladiator is Ijaz, but I think he's eating at the moment. So, um, without further ado, I'm just going to put the link out, inshallah. Um, well, let's get this show on the road. So, any non Muslims um, are welcome now to come onto the stream to challenge um, Islam. You guys talk amongst yourselves while I just sort all the bits and pieces out. Yeah, it's going to pin the links and that. Yeah, alhamdulillah. Good to see you, brothers. Um, I think it's the first time uh, Brother Sharif's been on this panel, or is it, has it been here before? I think this is actually my third time. I was going to oh, say, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe, <laughs> maybe not while I was, I was no, on. No, no, the... first time with yourself, actually. Oh, okay, okay. Always yeah. good to have uh, you on the team, and uh, obviously, Brother Daniel as well. No, no, first time. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, yeah, I'm very excited to be here, see what it's like. And uh, yeah. So what's what's new on your side, Brother Daniel? Any projects that you're working on? Yeah, alhamdulillah, we have some uh, projects coming up, inshallah, with Muslim Skeptic. And uh, there's Genius of Islam, if you've heard of it. It's like a video <laughs> series that we've been working on with uh, Alessna Institute and Muslim Skeptic. So episode okay. three, uh, we have two episodes, and the third one, we're just trying to wrap it up, and inshallah, it'll be um, very exciting when it comes out. We're we're very excited for it to come out, inshallah. Okay. So, what what's the topic? Sorry, I didn't. Uh, I wasn't following the episodes. Yeah, the topic is um, polytheism. Okay. So the question of well, what is so special about monotheism? And we know in Islam that the greatest injustice is to um, worship other than Allah or to assign partners to Allah, shirk. Uh, so a lot of Muslims ask, like, what is the wisdom of this? Like, what is the meaning of this? I don't really understand the value. And uh, this episode is dedicated to Tawheed. It's dedicated to Shirk, understanding the difference and what is, you know, the real injustice of Shirk. Okay. So when you say a polytheism, like, is it directed towards uh, Hindus or any particular religion or any polytheists? uh polytheism in general but there's a lot of hinduism in there it's a lot of uh, buddhism there's a lot of uh christianity and judaism and then also some uh, aztec religion <laughs> and native wow. american religion yeah interesting yes yeah apparently um there's a very very few what I, I would say uh live streams where we can actually engage directly with hindus so uh, on Dawa Wise, we were planning to have a stream where we can engage directly with someone who would represent from the Hindu Hindu uh, side. So rather than a Muslim talking on behalf of Hindus, I would rather engage them directly, so that people wouldn't say that oh he's being biased or 
not fair or something like that. And it's quite difficult. You know, at Speaker's Corner, we have been there for so many years and we rarely come across any Hindus to have a dialogue with. So the ones we come across, they barely know about their religion. And when we do engage them, people say that, oh, you're, you're just uh, having a debate with some random people. Well, where are the knowledgeable people from amongst the Hindus? Why don't you come to Speaker's Corner and engage like all the other religions and even the atheists and agnostic are there? So where are these Hindus who want to defend their religion and their faith? Um, and is, is, is Hinduism defendable? Really? Well, that's that's what we want to see. We want them to come forward, yes, and tell us about your religion, if it's so sophisticated, if it's so wonderful, so global, um, and then come and show us what's, what's I, the beauty I, about Hinduism. I, I wouldn't like somebody to shine a torch if I was a Hindu. <laughs> really, uh, really. Monkey yeah. armies and Ganeshes and all that business. I would I'd just rather leave it in caste systems and throw in the wife on the fire and all that stuff. I would just leave it. And the river yeah. Ganges and that nasty river. Just leave it, mate. Just, leave it. just let us be Hindus and we're not going to involve you, bother with you guys. We, we want someone who knows the scripture to come forward. And if you guys are the Muslims or any non-Muslims listening out there, if you guys know anybody who is knowledgeable and who would like to come and have a dialogue with us on a live stream, please get in contact with uh, Dawa Weiss. Uh, so it's basically um, dawawise at gmail.com or just the, the the contact is on the on the website, which is in my sure. name tag. The link to your channel is actually in the video description as well. All you guys, yeah. all your links to your, you know, the Muslim Skeptic and Thought of Adventure podcast and yourselves channel. So if you check the, uh, the, the description, you'll see all, all the links directly to your channels, inshallah. Sure. Okay, just a quick one. Anyone in the back chat right now, I can see Existential Naturalist has already got his camera on. Can you guys switch on your cameras, please? No one can see you, just me, just so we know you're real people. That's all. All right, uh, if you don't, there you go. All right, I see you, old wolf, no worries. You're not Muslim, are you? Just shake your head if you're not a Muslim. Yeah, I know you're not a Muslim, Existential Naturalist. What about you, old wolf, you're Muslim? All right, no worries. Rob's there as well. Antinatalist. Oh, please. So, anyway, let's start. Let's get the ball rolling. Um, existential naturalist, welcome to the arena. Watch your flex. Hello, can you guys hear me? We can hear you, sir. Cool. Hello, I'm actually very nervous. Uh, it's my you first live chat. Guy. I've been Let, watching you guys. Let's start with your name. What's your name, mate? Uh, my real name is Trevor. I'm from Trevor. Trevor. Hi, Trevor. Yeah, welcome. welcome. Yeah. Thank you. I've been watching all of your debates. I feel like I'm going to get destroyed here. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm feeling trapped, right? Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a, obviously I'm a naturalist, physicalist, humanist, nihilist, uh, but a good one. I can see Sharif rubbing his hands. Go on, man, what's your point? <laughs> what's your claim? What's your issue? Um, I basically find... I, I was a Christian before. Uh, I don't think that, I think I find it difficult to separate um, real claims, kind of, from fake ones. I guess so. Maybe I just defaulted to the naturalist position because it's kind of like you know uh, nature and what we can see, reality, what we can observe, what we what we can test is a little bit more. Um, I don't know how to how to put it, but yeah, uh, kind of. I'm quite nervous actually. Um, so yeah, I. Sharif, can you stop licking your lips, mate? Sorry, carry on, carry on, Trevor. <laughs> I'm not licking uh, my lips. I really feel like I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna walk out of here like regretting this, but anyway. Well, no, no, just... this, this is good because this this is where you'll get your beliefs stretched and any claims stretched. See, many people say to me, oh, how is this fair, 5v1, this, that, the other? I'll let you into a secret, Trevor. The reason I set up the arena was because I wanted people to come on to challenge Islam with the best argument they got. I want to see them come and stretch the panelists, yeah? And at the same time, I want to see the panelists respond to whatever claim comes towards them from every single angle. So basically it just demolishes that particular point. And then what I will do, I will take all the academia that's on show, I will make it succinct, I will relate to the lay people. So I'm like a conduit, do you get me? Sure. So if you're confident in your claims, welcome. Yeah, we're here to counter your claims. 
And we're, and we're here to demonstrate, and what this is what we've done every time on the arena. We're here to demonstrate there is no claim against Islam that can be substantiated, which can be upheld, to challenge the reality and the truth of Islam. Do you get me? It, they, they, sure. they, people have tried and failed. People might come to try to present Christianity, which then gets turned upon them, and the mirror gets shown to them, and they realize it's not actually what they think it is. Yeah. So um, so you you were a Christian. Why did you leave Christianity? Just so I can understand. Um, you know what? The thing is, I, I guess that nobody is going to leave Christianity for the same reasons, right? And it mm -hmm. took me like four years. For me, some, some people say, oh, it was like one little thing, and I immediately knew it was incorrect, right? But I was a believer for at least 25 years, probably about 28 wow. years. Um, and then it took me four years to deconvert. Um, just a couple of uh, chinks in the armor and cracks in the wall started to stand out to me. Um, I think the, the first one was, um, you know, Moses and Joshua going into Canaan and God telling them to, you know, kill everyone. And it's like, okay, you've just, you've just received the Ten Commandments and <laughs> now you're told to, like, destroy, you know, man, woman and child or take the the virgins or whatever it was you know and it just um it was just a contradiction to me it was just okay. like these are just men soldiers going in there and like doing their own thing and trying to you know use god in this, as an excuse um so that was just the first thing um then just yeah it kind of just unraveled for me from there oh okay so your position right now you believe in god don't believe in god no, no, I'm a naturalist, physicalist, no God, no supernatural, no heaven, mm -hmm. hell, ghosts, demons, jinns, nothing okay. supernatural. Wait, but you're, you're also an existentialist, so how does that factor in? It seems like well, contradictory well, philosophies. I call, I call myself, myself an it. existential naturalist. I, I basically take the word existential to mean uh, that I, I value the, the deeper meanings in life, right? Um, I want to consider the moral questions, the, you know, how best to live your life, be a good person, you know, be kind to other people. Um, I have a beautiful wife in the other room, you know, I, I just want to be a good person, right? And I didn't leave Christianity and go into all kinds of debauchery or whatever. It was just, I lost my faith. And yeah, so the thing for me is really the, the, where Christianity and the Abrahamic faiths come from, their very early history, um, and some of the claims. So, okay, so some of the claims of, I mean, I know that you guys are quite anti-evolution, from what I what I gather, right? Uh, anti-evolution. Where do you get that? What, what, right? what do you mean am by I that? Correct or not? Well, what do you well, mean by anti-evolution? I mean, you've made some quite a number of. Uh, anti-evolution videos that i've watched um anti-evolution videos um i don't think we've made anti-evolution has videos, anyone maybe. here made anti-evolution videos i i haven't hashem sharif <laughs> we, we, we had a we had right. four episodes <laughs> don't watch them <laughs> daniel Gilly. daniel you're the one man yeah yeah <laughs> My um so yeah so how then do you okay let, let's put it this way then mm -hmm. sorry trevor yeah, so before we go into evolution, Trevor, I just want to understand why are you a naturalist, but at the same time looking for deeper meaning in life, at the same time also being a nihilist as well, because nihilism in yeah. essence is say there is no meaning in life. Yeah, there's no intrinsic or objective meaning in life, but yeah. you know you can still create, and I believe that we all actually create a subjective meaning to our lives. And it's not necessarily one meaning to your life. Like right now, we're all talking to each other. We're conversing. This can be something interesting for you. So it can be, you know, your um, dawa can be a part of the meaning of your life, right? But you can also but have Trevor, meaning of your life yeah. with your family and friends, some hobbies, those types of things bring value to your life. But yeah. ultimately... But Trevor, the problem, the problem is, though, is that... On the one hand, you're a physicalist, and the second, yeah. on the, and then the, the other hand, you're talking about some level of subjective meaning. Now, if you're trying to apply some sort of subjective meaning, are you saying that this meaning transcends the physical world, the physicality, i.e., or are we just simply products of matter in motion, non conscious matter that interacts with one another? No, I mean, we are conscious. Um, a basis of naturalism is is that we are all rational 
uh, conscious beings and I share reality with you. So, no, I understand that. But what I'm saying is this, is obviously you understand this idea of the hard problem of consciousness. Yeah. The, the idea that consciousness, there is a difficulty reducing it to the physical. Yeah. But when sure. we start talking about meaning and aesthetics and value, all of these things, they transcend the material. If you're saying, no, 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 all of these things, all of the things that occur within our head that we assign to as having value and meaning and even subjective yeah. meaning and even giving ourselves meaning yeah. seems to indicate that we are more than just non-conscious material that's interacting with other non-conscious material. Yeah. Yes, we might right. turn around and say this creates some sort of consciousness, but ultimately under an identity theory of consciousness, everything you think of is reducible to some sort of non-conscious interaction. But on the same time, you want to say, no, we can talk about meaning. We can give our life meaning in a yep. subjective way, which means in, the, in, in essence, it means that you're transcending the, that, the fact that you are more than just physical. Mm, not necessarily. Um, I am a physicalist, so basically there's two types, uh, completely reductionist or em emergentist. Basically, consciousness is an emergent property of, of the physical brain, and we, we conceive of things through abstractions. That's okay. the Okay, so when you say, when, yeah, yeah, so I know, emergent, emergent reduction, eliminative, yeah. functional, different forms of of how to explain consciousness. In fact, on Thought Adventure podcast, we had a whole series of topics on this particular uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. The problem is that even if you want to hold on to an emergent theory of consciousness, it doesn't really explain where consciousness comes from. Yeah, it doesn't really tell me where consciousness is. It's, it's like saying emergent theory is like saying I have a bottle, I rub the side of the bottle and a genie pops out. Yeah, it merges from it. Yeah, I have this sure. non-conscious physical material that interacts and then suddenly this consciousness pops out. Yeah, it's, it's fudging yeah. the argument. And that's why I'm saying, I'm saying that if you want to be sincere to physicalism and naturalism, mm -hmm. either you're reductionist or eliminative when it comes to the issue of consciousness. Yeah, meaning mm -hmm. consciousness so under eliminative is... would, be, would be the fact that consciousness is just really an illusion. The idea that we have this qualia is just an illusion. Yeah, or yeah. reduction is that you reduce the brain states physically to the, and you map them directly to the conscious states. I'm just saying is that this idea of meaning, this idea of value that you want to give things, it seems to mean that you're looking at people or things or yourself as more than just a physical manifestation of non-conscious interaction of matter. I mean... Not really. Um, I mean, if I had to reduce it all, we're just matter in motion. But I mean, I, I do place higher value on humans, but that's really only because we have a, a better, not a better state of consciousness, but maybe a higher state of consciousness, or we have a much better uh, neural plasticity. So it's just the ability to learn things. But I think that many animals from whales uh, and sea mammals to dogs and animals, monkeys, elephants have, to some degree, uh, quite a high level of consciousness, right? Yeah, but um, Trevor, you, you just maybe to wind it back a little bit further as sure. well, you do understand about the hard problem of consciousness. I do. I don't think that it's actually a, a problem. I think it's a problem that we create for ourselves. So it's not a the, problem. The hard so, problem. So you there, solved the hard problem of, of consciousness. <laughs> no, no, I don't think that we have. I don't think that we necessarily have the equipment to 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 properly properly analyze it and properly figure everything out. But I think it's very clear that from when we're born, our brain creates branches in, in, in our mind, in our physical mind, which provides us with consciousness. Consciousness is kind of like a similar, I'm not a solipsist, but consciousness is really just a simulation on, of the environment that we have around us, taking uh, sensory data in, processing it, using abstractions, and abstractions on top of abstractions. But none of those okay. things are none of those things are physical. Yeah. Sure. I mean, there's, there's like, lots of, of course. Like if I say the number ten, thing. the number ten is not physical. So I mean, a, 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 a unicorn, a pink unicorn, is not physical either. 
but it consciousness is just a a, a product of brain states ultimately so mathematics is a product of brain states can be yeah is truth the matter i mean if you if you're writing something down or you're doing mathematics on a calculator it's it's being done by the calculator right so no but the concept of in mathematics those aren't what's in a calculator or computer it's something mental so you're saying that they're not real but we we created we essentially created mathematics the language of math so then how can ability to how does that reconcile with your physicalism because if you're a physicalist committed to the physical world uh, have you studied science? It's all about math. It's misunderstanding like a physicalist position, though. I mean, we don't think that, like, yes, everything is physical in nature, but mathematics is not supernatural, right? So it's just abstract. No, it's, it's not physical. I mean, mathematics is not a physical thing. You can't hold sure. it. There are no atoms yes. that will. Right. Yep. So there are, there are other concepts, mathematical yes, concepts, going to physics. So if you're a physicalist, you think that physics describes the universe or even determines the motion of galaxies and stars but those yeah. things are mathematical and they're not they're well, not actually we use emergent. mathematics to, to describe them and right. to, well, to work out the properties and the laws of nature and things like that well the top i agree with you they're not people physical, like albert but... einstein people like richard feynman actually said that mathematics is the st- structure it's the structure of the universe is mathematical it's not just an invention of the mind I think I, I still mean, there think are, humans. Or here's kind of, here's another question for you: Does the past yeah. exist? Does the does the past exist? Yeah. How do you know that? Of how time, do you know so that? How do you know that? General relativity: just, the past exists. No, no. It's how do you know a, that? Let me finish. How do you know that the entire universe, including us and our memories, wasn't just created in the past five minutes? Look, if you if you have to press me on that. I, nobody in the world can answer that question, okay? But I know, that's baseline, why it's a reputation of naturalism. But as, as the baseline of a naturalistic worldview, we be, believe in an observable um, reality that we can test and and find out the laws. I mean, so so that this reality is governed by the laws of nature, right? And that we can, we can test these or we can do observations, experimentation, and and discover these laws. But so you that, believe that your consciousness is... uh, has? You're, you're basically appealing to empirical evidence now with observable, yep. testable yep. kind. Yep. Has anyone done done that with consciousness in a lab? Sure, they have. I just don't think that no. they've done enough. So you think there is empirical evidence for your consciousness? Enough. And also, a lot of people, a lot of people don't actually. Um, necessarily want to have their brains experimented on so sorry so trevor what experiments have they done on consciousness yeah i would like to know too on the hard problem of consciousness but you just said they have so we're going to pin yeah, you to i it. mean I've, I've watched a lot of uh, youtube clips on it so what's the youtube so, you watch? what was the experiments <laughs> so trevor uh, trevor just so to yeah. help you out Mm-hmm. There's two aspects. There's the easy problem of consciousness, which isn't that easy, but yeah. it's called the easy problem because there is a way of being able to address this. And then there's a the hard problem of consciousness. The easy sure. problem of consciousness is about correlation, correlating brain states with conscious states, yeah, or neuronal yeah. activity with what a person's thinking or feeling. That's called the easy problem of consciousness. The hard problem of consciousness is to explain the causation between brain states and conscious states. That's yeah. called the hard problem of consciousness. Mm-hmm. Now, the hard problem of consciousness is an in-principle problem. Yeah, At this moment in time, if you're a physicalist and an empiricist, at this moment in time, at the very least that we can say is that there is no observable empirical data to explain the causal relationship between neuro- neuronal states or brain states and chemistry and consciousness. There isn't a link between the two. And in fact, people like Professor David Chalmers says there's an unbridgeable gap between explaining the physical with the immaterial or conscious states. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to be sincere about the empirical method, you would have to say that consciousness cannot be reduced to empiricism. Yeah. In the, in a lab or in a, uh, you know, observable, testable way. 
If that is the case, then according to you, consciousness doesn't exist because if everything is only, you know, what we can observe and what we can test, and here's an aspect that we cannot observe, we cannot test, I consciousness, then you can, you'd have to say, well, either you would have to say empiricism is not the only way to establish truth, or the second way to deal with the situation is to turn around and say consciousness doesn't exist. Now, obviously, I don't think you're going to say consciousness doesn't exist no. because then that would refute your idea of being a human uh, sure. humanist. Yeah. So therefore, you'd have to say, well, actually, empiricism is the problem here. Empiricism is not the only method by which we can ascertain whether something is true reality and whether something's an imagination. We have other methods of uh, of us ascertaining that. Okay. Do you know Do you know how AI works? Um, they basically simulate AI on neurons in, in the human brain, right? When you when you design an AI, you basically have multiple levels. It's very very complicated. If you have to reverse engineer an AI, it is super difficult. Okay, if you have to reverse engineer every single one of the nodes and the connections in an AI brain, like AlphaGo, for example, once it's been trained, it is very difficult. So you can look at Susan Greenfield, just as she's just one person um, on the Closer Tr to Truth channel. Uh, but there's a lot of them. Look, um, I think What's that got to do with brain this discussion, is actually, Trevor? Sorry. The brain is very, very difficult to... I agree with you that the hard problem is very difficult. I think that empiricism is the way to go. I don't think that we necessarily have the equipment to analyze the billions of transistors, that, or, I mean, the billions of neurons in our brain. Um, and yeah, I'm going to have yeah, to see to, we will go, eventually sorry. get there and be able to recognize. And just remember that everybody's brain is different, right? So it's going to be wired different, especially when we're doing abstractions. Um, some things have yeah. certain regions of the brain that control them and others are spread out over multiple regions of the brain. So Trevor, I think the problem is, is that I don't think you understand what the hard problem of consciousness is and how deep the problem of consciousness is it's not about trying to work out the connections of the neurons like i said that's called the easy problem of consciousness that's talking about correlation yeah that's like like i said the example that professor donald hoffman gives is where you rub a lamp and a genie pops out and you say okay this lamp if i rub it a genie pops out that tells me correlation but it doesn't tell me causation causation is being able to explain two fun or three fundamental things when it regards to consciousness one qualia which is to do with our first person subjective experience which are indescribable yeah uh, which is very different to the way science operates yeah and i'll explain that second one is to do with intentionality intentionality is to do with our ability to think about things yeah objects that are not directly observable in our sense perceptions like thinking about pink bunny rabbits in space and the third thing is to do with free will yeah now, the issue of qualia, the reason why we say it's indescribable, it's like, for example, if you had a person who was blind from birth, yeah, and he was, um, uh, and you ask him, you, you, you try to describe to him the color red, yeah, and he's never observed the color red, it's impossible. Now, from a science, scientific point of view, I can explain color by talking about the, ref uh, the, the, the wavelength of light, at a specific wavelength and specific energy. I, I have a third person description, third person objective analysis, but a conscious qualia experience is a first person subjective experience, which is indescribable to another person. Hence, I cannot know how you perceive red. And in the same way, you cannot know how I perceive red. And looking at the regions in my brain and the firing of the neurons will not tell me how we are perceiving red, how we perceive it our perception yeah so this is an area consciousness is a clear cut area which refutes materialism and physicalism yeah and even if you want to turn around and say well in the future we will to be honest that just sounds like science of the gaps and faith to me i love that term science of the gaps um look i i i'll concede that the hard the hard problem of consciousness is a very very difficult thing um, I don't think that uh, physicalists have thrown in the towel to un t the towel to understand it, um, and I'm not a neuroscientist, so I I'm not in that field. So <laughs> I don't know what else to say about. Even if you I, were I agree in the field, you, difficult one. Yeah. Brother Trevor, even if you were in the field, when you talk about neuroscience, you know, that is the easy uh, problem of consciousness, which Brother Sharif was telling about. 
your your consciousness itself is not physical because i think that's what you you're still thinking is physical and someday you'll be able to observe it in the lab under a microscope or some other device um, it's it's basically like um, trying to search for plastic using a metal detector you're using the wrong tool if sure. you're going to use science as a tool and looking for um evidence which is empirical in nature so you're looking for a naturalistic source somewhere we're using a naturalistic uh, tool to look for something which is metaphysical because science doesn't deal with metaphysical at least not the naturalistic science yeah so you need to bear in mind that someday you're, you're saying that someday they will discover this and this is where the science of the gaps comes in i guess i'll make another and also case trevor for... just as another point as this is that that's just consciousness daniel also raised the point about truth is truth something that's physical or is truth something which is not physical yeah i do true propositions exist and are true propositions something which is just identical to physical states in the same way he talked about mathematics is mathematics something which is physical or is mathematics something which is uh, abstract and immaterial like for example if i turn around and i talk about the circumference of a circle and i say it's 2 pi r well pi uh, a, a perfect circle doesn't exist in the physical world. It exists mm -hmm. in a mathematical world. Is that a true statement? If it's a true statement, 2 pi r is a true statement. It doesn't exist in the physical world because you can't have perfect circles. Then you've got a truth which is immaterial, not physical. Yeah? I'm just saying, I, I come across a lot of people yeah. who, who are, who are uh, you know, atheists, who are materialists, you know, really hedge their bets about materialism. But I honestly think they've not really thought this through. They've not understood yet some of the severe implications it has. Yeah, like for example, how it has severe implications on free will. Is free will does it exist under a materialistic paradigm? Does it uh, consciousness? We've talked about the idea of mathematical truths, the idea of true propositions. Any true propositions? Do they I don't actually believe in, exist? Um, libertarian free will. To, to answer how that question. How you, about the claim that all truths are empirical? That's the basis I, I, of empiricism and naturalism, right? So how, do you prove, how do you prove that all truths are empirical or all, all truths are natural? So, I, don't know. I mean, empiricism is just self-contradictory in, in a very clear way. I can't answer to that. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I you're, in good, a lot of philosophy. you're in good company because a lot of philosophers... No philosopher could have answer, could answer that. Okay, but um, I just want to say uh, the emergent e emergentism or uh, emergent properties of the brain. There are there's weak emergentism and then there's strong. Strong is is incompatible with physicalism, right? So I'm I'm weak in that in that sense, meaning that I I believe that our brain states are an emergent property of. The, the physical brain and all I can say is that uh, for me I just still feel like the evidence is strongly in favor of brains and consciousness being physical thing because we can damage it we can damage brain we damage consciousness we can destroy brains and for me when the brain dies your consciousness dies I'm so just... for me it's, it's, it's eternally linked I'm just a little bit confused. You just said you were a physicalist, but you have beliefs. How, how do you test those beliefs or know that they're true, as Brother Daniel said? How do I test my beliefs? Um, I stand on the shoulder of giants. Um, I can't test every single thing that I that I know, right? Or that Who, I Whose shoulder are you out. standing on, mate? So, <laughs> those that in, in testimonial science evidence. That, that tested these things. So testimonial. Um, Testimonial evidence. And why, why do you believe it's true? Um, I don't have much evidence in favor of the contrary. I contrary. I, I, I know that brain states and, and the heart problem is definitely a difficult problem, um, but I still tie it back to a physical brain. If we shoot you in the head, you're going to die. I mean, everything that yeah, we but know of dies. When you lose consciousness, Tre Trevor, Trevor, when the brain is damaged. What, yeah, but Trevor, every yeah. example that you give works for True. idealism and also works for dualism. 
So, for example, dualism would say, well, yeah, you would need to have a physical brain as well as a, so you need some physical as well as some immaterial or material and immaterial aspect in order to have consciousness. And so, uh, you know, if you damage, like, for example, if you've got a, a computer, you'd have hardware and software. If you damage the hardware, then, yeah, the computer's not going to work. Yeah, but in the yeah. same way, just because you've got the physical components doesn't mean the computer's going to work. You still need the software. Yeah, so yeah. the same, ex so every, ex every argument that you've used to try to justify that physical brain equals consciousness can be used under dualistic uh, formulation as well. Yeah. yeah, it's not unique to, uh, to materialism. Yeah, so yeah, I'm just saying right. is that you're, you're not using... So you agree with me? That's uh, good. I found uh, that weak emergentism is quite compatible. We, we, it's, it's almost like we're speaking the same kind of language, but we uh, not coming to the same kind of conclusions, really. But it's, it's still that uh, there's this emergent property which can be similar to what you consider to be dualism. Right. So I'm not saying that every single thing is physical, although I'm a physicalist, like there are abstractions, right, that we use, but they still boil down to a physical something. It does sound a little bit right? contradictory, though, now, Trevor, mm -hmm. isn't it? Not everything is physical. In fact, the most important aspects of human beings are not physical. They just emerge sure. in a weekly way. Sure. I feel so like I, I'm, I think, I'm being I think destroyed Trevor, I already, think... so... <laughs> <laughs> In a nice I, think, I think, Trevor, you should go on the Thought Adventure podcast. I think that will unravel this for you, my friend. Yeah, come come on to our podcast. Go, we go, have a similar... Yeah, Jerry, yeah, Yusuf, sure. Jake, nice, and um, Abdurrahman. Yusuf, Abdurrahman. And yeah. you'll, you'll leave a Muslim. <laughs> Speaking of Muslim, by the way... We have haven't you... even gotten to, like, uh, arguments for God or and things like that, but it, it's cool. I'll come on again if you guys want yeah. to hear oh, oh, Okay, I'll give you a quick one. Sorry, yeah. my camera's messing up, so I'll switch it off. Um, see, for me, the argument for God is the existence of the universe. I don't believe the existence of the universe could exist without a creator. Yeah, I don't it believe... never existed. Get... Sorry? Say again? Go for it. Go for it. No, you can make the your claims. Argument right. for God. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I believe the three sciences, physics, chemistry, and biology, all point to the existence of an intelligent agency behind everything. Yeah, I, 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 and I, I, what I'd ask you is why you concede absurd probabilities um, to hold on to your position. I just find the arguments in favor uh, to be. Well, they're not in favor. The, the arguments in favor are absurd probabilities. In favor of, of God. No, no. God you're you're conceding absurd God's. probabilities. You're having to accept on blind faith that random mutation is a thing which was harnessed by natural selection. You've got to uh, believe with blind faith that the magic custard existed uh, by itself, yeah? You've got to ex yeah. believe by blind sure. faith that the universe was able to fine tune itself. You've yeah. got to accept all this on blind faith, mate, because, and the probabilities of these things are bizarre. And for someone who's intelligent, who, con who looks at these things and will go with the absurd probabilities just to hold on to their position is in itself bizarre. I think we don't have enough understanding of of these things yet. That's all I can say. No, no. That. The more we, we were talking about, like things like abiogenesis and no abiogenesis is just you just it's just another fancy word for the origins. Yeah, basically, sure. yeah. The more we discover about um, in biology, the more we discover in chemistry, the more we discover in physics points towards an intelligent agency. And my question to you would be this. We know we find information in DNA. In our human experience, we never find information without an intelligent agency be behind it. So why does somebody like yourself, who's an empiricist, who's a naturalist, when he comes across information in DNA, does not assume that same position? Why does he do a special pleading and say, well, in this case, there is no intelligent agency. This information is, in fact, random. Yeah. Mm. DNA for me is biochemistry. Where it comes from is a long, long history. Um, the DNA that we see now is three, four billion years old. Um, do, you, do you believe the DNA contains have, information? It contains a type of information, yes. Right. And, do we, and in our human experiences, do we ever get information without an intelligent agency behind it? Mm, not artificial intelligence, I guess. 
No, I mean, do we ever get information without an intelligent agency behind it? And if so, what? No. no. So why in this case are you excluding an intelligent agency just because it doesn't suit your natural your naturalistic position? Well, I this don't is... know what that would look like. I mean, so so what is the position if you look at DNA? Is is God like controlling every strand of the DNA? Is he controlling the chemical reactions in DNA? Is he like where when you look at the DNA and I've seen it's a brilliant question. Videos, yeah, That's a so, brilliant question, but but you have to concede the intelligent agency first and determine what is the nature I mean, of that. Then, then you have to think about every single chem chemical reaction that exists on the planet from any chemical reaction that happens in your body being controlled by God to, you know, I mean, you take drugs. Well, the mechanisms, no, no, we're talking about the mechanisms. Okay. So, again, using DNA as an example... Our human experience tells us we don't get information without an intelligent agency. Why are you then throwing this under the bus when it comes to this? Because I've been reading, you know, with regards, uh, you know, what scientists believe, that this matter would be settled if it didn't bring to the conclusion of a god. Yeah. And thus, it's, it's very, very clear. The probabilities of random mutation is so bizarre to accept it. It's like saying uh, either William Shakespeare wrote William Shakespeare or a billion monkeys on a billion typewriters for a billion years wrote William Shakespeare. And what you're saying, mm, I go with a billion monkeys. This is the probabilities you're clutching at. Yeah, that's just biology. In chemistry, you have to look at carbon and the fine tuning that needs to take place for carbon to come in existence. And without carbon, you've got no magic custard that creates your single cell, which causes your random mutation. Yeah. And before so, you have all your, um, you, you know, your stars where carbon's created within, you need the universe to um, become what it became, finely tuned. Mm -hmm. And again... So on on random mutations, every single one of us in this room right now has 50 to 60 random mutations in our No, bodies. no, no. What's the probability of a cell randomly mutated? Every Being... one of us No, no, no. Listen, listen, to me. listen to me. First thing, you can't even demonstrate whether it's random. That's the first thing. It Second is. thing, you can't. How do you, how do you prove we randomness? All, okay, so if you look at the molecular clock of humans, every single human that exists has between 50 to 60 random mutations. Listen to me. How do you know it's random? Because you can look at you and you can take your, your two parents. You can you can compare your DNA to your How parents, do you know it's random? And you can see that, that it's random mutations. How do you know it's random? How do you demonstrate it's, of, it's random it's with empirical evidence? It's it's part of the molecular clock to to determine how far back an ancestry goes. It's just I don't know how they do it, okay? It's biologists. You can't do it. You can't prove randomness. You can't. You can't. No, you can't. Hamza's how do you prove randomness? That it's how do you, what, the idea of randomness in the universe, how do you know that there is no um, deeper control by another power, such as God, or if you're not a um, Muslim or a Christian, if you're a deist, for example, deists believe that in determinism, right? that everything is happening in a determined way. Even if you don't know the law of nature, the physical law that is controlling it, it's still happening, but it's not random, even though it may appear to be random. So I think that's what Hamza is referring to. And you, you really can't know I that. understand what the, 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 concept, the idea that he uses to, to demonstrate random. But look at molecular clock. You can you can search online for molecular clock. That is based on the mutations that we each have as as individuals. Is anyone just it's a different type of like random? I think that maybe we're just talking over okay. each other. Or right. sorry, so, well, the randomness I'm referring to. Sorry, is the single cell that came out the magic custard? Yeah, sure. um, and we've got this single cell. Uh, and what's the probability that this mutation that apparently occurs randomly? Is positive. So okay, you're going to abiogenesis. No, abiogenesis. no, I've give you, I've give you the cell. Life. I've give you the cell. Okay, I'm not asked, how cell. did the magic custard come to, and all that. Right. I'm saying we have the cell. Right. And for evolution or for natural selection to occur, there needs yep. to be some kind of mutation in that cell. And what is the probability of a mutation occurring in that cell that is beneficial? Okay, so have a look at the um, Levski experiments. It's a 30 year experiment, experiment with E. coli, strands of E. coli that they've been, even up until today, they have about 73,000 generations of it. Within four years, they had uh, three positive mutations in 
in their o E. coli strands. So look at it, Levski, it's a it's a basically a 30 year experiment that they've been running every single every single day they they take 1% of the e coli out they destroy the rest and they they've been monitoring and cataloging all of the the e coli for the last 30 years you can have a look at all of the the mutations that they've gone through within 6,000 generations, which was four years, they had three positive um, mutations, and the E. coli uh, could also mutate the ability to eat a new food source. Yeah, but Trevor, was... no one here is disputing the mutations, we're disputing the random, the randomness behind the mutations, which is your fundamental claim. It's random, it's random mutations happening in, in, in the strands of well, E. coli. You just said they engineered it. No, it's not engineered. You said they were it's taking E. coli away that they breed. That they breed. It's just normal. You said they were e. taking stuff away or something. Bacteria. Yeah. So they. So in their in their test tubes, oh, they I take one percent out each day and they destroy the rest. And then one they second. and then they use that the next day. They give it a food source and. All right. Grow. Just hold that thought. Sure. Someone else demolish that. I'll just be back one minute. You can. Uh, in Wikipedia, you can search for it. There's, uh, there's many. Levs, 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 levs. Levs. Three year experiment. And on the to... right hand side you can see the, the the timeline and you can see the citrate plus that these um, uh, E. coli were able to eat. That's a new food source. They developed the ability, okay, to eat a new food source. Trevor, we're that not is... disputing any of this or that the experiments are valid, whatever the case may be. We're disputing the random claim behind it, brother. These are Two random mutations. Things. They can show you the random mutations. The majority you... of them are, are degradatory, okay, or um, like bad mutations. Yeah. But the thing is, evolution doesn't. It, evolution works mainly in the good ones. And yes, they are very, very small good mutations. But the good mutations Trevor. slowly build yeah, up. What, Trevor, what have, we're not. <laughs> Go ahead. Trevor, what do you have? What do you have to say about? Have you heard of this concept of irreducible complexity? Yeah, it's so garbage. How do you Every single one of his claims, Michael B. He's claims has been refuted. No, they from have the not. hemoglobin have to flagellum. Every single one of them. They have not been refuted, and in yeah, fact, they, they haven't been responded to actually, because you haven't seen just, the responses. It's not just one, yes, I have. It's not just one mutation that has to be beneficial. You have to have multiple mutations at the same time that have to be beneficial in the particular no. ecology. With That's the claim. Certain, certain, so this is so mathematically improbable that you have so many naturalists just like you, mathematicians. Have you heard of David Glertner, Yale Computer Science? Check out his video. He says it's impossible. Evolution is mathematically impossible. Check out David Berlinski. He taught mathematics at Stanford University. He says it's mathematically impossible. Check out Thomas Nagel professor at NYU of philosophy, also an atheist, says that evolu Darwinian evolution is impossible mathematically and philosophically. Check out Jerry Fodor, Jerry Fodor, his book, What Darwin Got Wrong, an atheist, one of the top philosophers in the world, according to academia, taught at Rutgers University, very well respected. He says that this is this makes no sense, Darwinian evolution. We have to go back to the drawing board and figure out a better explanation for the origin of life because this hand-waving science of the gaps, oh, we just need enough time and it'll magically come together. This is all nonsense that no actual in intellectuals take seriously. Okay. It's true that the claim will, will render evolution impossible. But evolution doesn't work according to that claim. The claim is a hypothetical improbability. The claim is that all of these things just randomly came together all at the same time. That's why it's irreducibly complex. But if you if you if you consider um, bacteria flagellum, right? We can see flagellum in every single one of the stages. I can show you images of the of different types of flagellum which has the tra every single one of the traits in the bacteria flagellum. It doesn't work the way that it is, it is um, you know, irreducible complexity is a claim that doesn't stand again, that doesn't stand up uh, to the burden of proof, basically. 
um, every single one of them, from the hemoglobin, the the guy who um, B he claimed he took some information from I can't remember what his name is, but he wrote a huge refutation. He studied hemoglobin like for thirty years. B he just looked, took hemoglobin and said, you know, this is irreducibly complex. It was universally refuted. Okay, can, so can has bacterial flagellum. Can I just there are multiple you, studies on it. Yeah. Let me sure. just interrupt you a second, if you don't mind, because I want to challenge this idea that all oh, this, the way that um, randomness can produce um, ran um, successful proteins. Yeah. Okay. One second. I have to stop my camera because it's messing around. Anyway, so I'll show you the book I'm reading from, and I advise you to read it. Yeah. It's called Return of the God Hypothesis by Stephen Meyer. Have you read it? I know. No, I haven't, but I've been watching you read it. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to read from it again. All right. So in his book, The Signature of the Cell, he said he performed an updated calculation of the probability of the origin of even a single functional protein or corresponding functional gene by chance alone. The calculations are based upon recent experiments in molecular biology, establishing the extreme rarity of functional proteins in relation to the total number of possible arrangements of amino acids corresponding to a protein of a given length. Taking that and several other relevant independent factors into account, I show that the probability of producing even a single functional protein of modest length, 150 amino acids, by chance alone in prebiotic environments stands at no better than a balancingly small one chance in 10 to the 164. An inconceivably small probability. To put this number in perspective, recall that physicists estimate there are only 10 to the power of 80 elementary particles in the entire universe. So the chances are uh, one to the, in 10 is 164. And yet in the whole of the universe, there's only 10 to the power of 80 um, elementary particles. So the probability is absolutely ridiculously small. So, uh, and then to say that this happened continuously and uh, over 3.5 billion years, which is apparently is from the, uh, this first cell to what we are, it, it, to, to believe that, you must believe in fairies at the bottom of your garden. You really, really do. Okay, yeah. so you can look. You can uh, look at some videos from Nina Sahai. She's an origins of of life researcher, and uh, Robert Hazen, and um, he studies uh, mineralogy. So you must know for when the when evolution came out, it was all just biologists looking at things, right? Then the burden of proof or the the onus went to uh, chemists, right? Then it was the geochemists, and now it's kind of like in the mineralogists, right? First of all, we have to st we have to actually understand what was the environment of the early Earth, okay? What minerals were on the Earth? Do you know that there were only three hundred minerals uh, on the early Earth? Now they're over five thousand, and and the difference actually came through organic life. There was less than one percent oxygen on the planet, okay? People don't actually understand this that it literally practically took a billion years of 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 um just photosynthesis just to get to the to the oxygen level that we have okay uh but anyway you can look at robert hazen he studies mineralogy and the evolution of minerals on the planet and how uh organic life has affected the the minerals and the prebiotic soup uh concept is kind me of magic custard. Out of favor in origins of life where the magic custard come from <laughs> That uh, hypothesis is falling kind of out of favor in favor of clay. But look at Nina's um, Oranges of Life talk, Nina Sahai. So, Trevor, does any of this undermine the existence of God? No. So what's the point? Because the whole idea you were talking about initially was naturalist this, naturalist that. Doesn't I'm, not in, God, does it? I, I, I'm not in favor of, of atheists saying any of these things disprove God, not evolution, not anything that we really discover, because you can ultimately you can always believe that God uh, had his hand in guiding evolution or guiding the, the first cells to come in, into existence or guiding chemistry and guiding uh, and guiding our mm -hmm. life. It doesn't disprove God. Let me just call one, I'm one not other in person. favor of, of those types of claims. You know, you mentioned... Um, Let me just call one uh, other person, Hashim. Just with yeah, sure. Okay, person. go on. So, Nobel laureate Christian Dudu, 
a leading origin of life biochemist until his death in 2013, categorically rejected the chance hypothesis precisely because he judged the necessary fortuitous convergence of events implausible in the extreme. In a memorable passage in his 1995 article, The Beginnings of Life on Earth, the Douve made explicit the logic by which he rejected the chance hypothesis. As he put it, a single freak, highly improbable event can conceivably happen. Many highly improbable events drawing a winning lottery number or the distribution of playing cards in the hand of bridge happen all the time. But a string of improbable events drawing the same lottery number twice or the same bridge hand twice in a row does not happen naturally. So this is a biochemist this, who studied the origin of life saying this. Now, I don't know who Nina is. Um, I don't know whether or not she's more knowledgeable than this guy. I have no idea whether she's no knowledgeable than, more knowledgeable than Stephen Meyer and his book that he wrote, Signature in the Cell. No idea. See, Nina could be anybody. She could be like you, just saying stuff. Because you've got no support. You're just believing testimony of Nina. Have you cha challenged her work? Have you questioned what she said? No. You've just accepted uh -huh. it because it suits your narrative. Sorry, Hashim, go on. She's at the University of Akron. She's a Who PhD. cares what university she goes to? Yeah, go sure. on, go on, Hashim. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to inquire from Trevor because uh, I was wondering if you would judge all Abrahamic faith based on your experience with Christianity. Kind of, because I think that the 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 origins of the faith in uh, Yahwehism is questionable to me. So yes. really, okay. Yeah. Um, neither the Quran nor the Hadith has the term Yahweh, so I don't think Islam falls in that. I think it's it's yeah. only fair that you should look at it uh, yourself. Like for example, I mean, look into the, Islam. The, right. I, I'm yeah. talking about the Yahwism. It was the proto. Uh, Proto-Judaism, Judaic faith, right? In in a god that came out of the Canaanite Le uh, Levant region, um, and yeah, uh, so Yahweh or well, it's 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 god a name that existed uh, I, with a few other yeah. gods like El and Baal and and kind of like a pantheon. It's, of it's, gods. it's a name, right? It's a it's a name that there can be any name of God then. The thing is, like, you have to look at the source. So I don't know if you're aware that, that in the New Testament, the term Yahweh doesn't appear even once. Does that mean the they don't believe in God? Yeah. yeah. Because they had already progressed. So Yahwism, if you look up on Wikipedia, what Yahwist, the original Yahwist religion was, that was before Judaism. So what Judaism came, kind of came out of that religion. And that's where all the Abrahamic faiths are. That's what they're all based on. Um, not not and, really. Let's say even let's say even if the people before Judaism believed in a deity called Yahweh, yes, yeah. that doesn't yeah. mean. For example, if the, if if a Hindu uses the term God and a Muslim uses the term God, they both are using the same term. But if you ask the Hindu to define God, they will define it fairly different to what a monotheist would define it as. You see what I mean? So just right, because sure. just because the terms are similar. It doesn't mean the faith is similar. So for you to actually judge all Abrahamic faith, in fact, even the pre-Abrahamic faiths, with the same kind of uh, understanding, it's it's really unfair. Okay, but so, I mean, would you say that your faith, would you say that uh, Judaism was a, a faith before that, that um, it's a continuation, Islam came yes. Out of, it's a continuation. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. It right. is a continuation. So Judaism is a yeah. continuation of the Yahwist faith from Canaan and the Levant. Okay. Yeah. So they the can be idol worshippers. So I'm not sure if the Canaanites were so, worshiping so. the same God. But look, like I said, the same terminology can be used. For example, even the term angel. Yes. You, sure. uh, you as someone coming from a Christian background, you might consider an angel to be a fallen. Uh, entity, you know, he might be good, right. he might have been a really good angel, but then Satan is a fallen angel. You see, the Muslims use the term angel as well, but we don't translate it as such, as the way the Christians do. So sometimes yeah. you might have the same terminology, yes, and it's it just doesn't mean doesn't mean that they have to mean the same thing. So what, what I would suggest is you look into Islam, uh, read the Quran, you know, by yourself, and then come to a conclusion rather than using your experience as a Christian to judge um, Islam. Is that fair? Okay. okay. Fair. All right. 
Are we doing have you looked into Islam, Trevor? Sorry. Have you looked I've into Islam? A, I've read a few um, verses of the Quran. The answer is no. The answer is no. I, no. Yeah, I can't say, <laughs> say that no. I have. I'll say okay. no. Ha okay. Have you looked into the various arguments for the existence of a necessary being? Yes. A creator. First cause arguments and things like that. My default position is going to going to be like a quantum field with a quantum fluctuation. Doesn't help you, mate. It doesn't help you. Field. Science of the gaps don't help you, mate. <laughs> so it's your 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 I'll default agree. position your default position is what a quantum foam. Uh, String okay. theory. I've never I've never really. No, no. Is that, it? I'm just asking you. Quantum I'm, fluctuations. I'm quantum you. field. Uh, M theory. Uh, yeah. What? And uh, probably <laughs> Why quantum do you hold gravity. it? So, do you believe that these are necessary beings, or do you believe that these are, you I don't know, think uh, that the, contingent? Whatever thing created this universe is some kind of necessary being that it's holding everything up and sustaining everything. No. No, I do you understand uh, what a necessary being means? Kind of. I, I guess I've got my own interpretation of that. So, do you want to tell me what yeah. you mean by it? So a necessary being uh, means something that cannot fail to exist, must okay. exist. Right. Yeah. And that could be a quantum field, right? I mean, so you, it could be yeah, something so that, that be... we haven't discovered yet. Yeah. Right. So that's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm, that's what I'm asking you. I'm asking you, are you saying that that's, you believe that's a necessary being? Membrane structures, membrane theory, uh, you know, When I talk about brains, field, that's, in, that's in string theory. Yeah, membrane. So, look, I don't know what's theory. beyond beyond this universe. To be honest with you, I'm not a physicist. Um, I can only rely on what they empirically. Well, a physicist test, can't tell right? you that either, mate. Sure. Okay, can I ask you a really quick question? Really, just uh, just yeah. slightly different to what we're talking about, but similarly related. Sure. Uh, you, you know the Kalam cosmological argument: whatever begins to exist has a cause. Yeah. Uh, the universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause. Do you have a problem right. with that argument? No, Do I you don't. have a problem I... with any of the premises? No. Okay. I don't. So you, the problem that so I you, so have, you, or where I tend to, okay, so like William Lane Craig is is famous for using Kalam, right? The problem is once he establishes that, and I'm I'm okay with that, like whatever, you'll write a quantum field, maybe that did it, right? But then he strings all of these other like hypothetical properties onto the onto God, right? It's personal. It's it's. Eternal, why does why mind, why, it's, it's, why da, 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 okay no hold on hold on Trevor why does it why do why do people who use the Kalam argument Kalam cosmological argument why do they why do they say it's personal and it cannot just be a, some sort of physical what's their argument because I mean typically in the Abrahamic faiths you you're dealing with a personal God that that wants no, to no. communicate that's not that's their argument given you revelation and that kind of thing. That's not the right, argument. I mean, that's not the argument they use. Okay, what's it? What is it then? The argument that they use is saying that if you have a non-conscious material or physical agent cause, and you have a temporal right. effect, or you have an effect from a non-physical, uh, so you have a temporal, so you have an effect from this non-conscious cause. Yeah, mm -hmm. then if the cause exists and everything necessary and sufficient for the cause to cause its effect exists then you'd yeah. have the effect you would agree with right. that isn't it if x causes sure. y if x exists then y would exist yeah. if sure. x is eternal what would what would the effect be if the cause is eternal what would the effect be i don't know i'm not a physicist honestly well, I it would know. be eternal wouldn't it if you have everything necessary and sufficient for a cause that you would have the effect okay yeah so you would have an okay. eternal effect. So they say, "Well, hold say, on." Say, Sharif, do you want to save him for Thought Avenger podcast? I think he needs you guys. <laughs> okay then. Because well, just, the just thing is, really quickly, just to is, finish I'm my B, I'm, just I'm, to finish the, your B theory. B theory I'm B theory. That, so, that's whole, so this universe is actually even, eternal. But, <laughs> it's even worse, that, right? That, that's why I asked you the question. I asked the question whether you had a problem with the the argument in itself. But just as a, a key key point, and I'll I'll end it here because I know Hamza wants to move on really quickly. But but you have to be clear if you're going to critique the argument in the KCA, you've got to be able to be under you've got to understand why they give the arguments that they give. The reason why they say it's a personal agent, what they mean by personal agent is a 
cause that has a mind or a cause that has the ability to choose. Yeah. The reason why they say right. that is because the effect is temporal, but the cause is eternal. And yep. to explain an eternal uh, and a temporal effect from an eternal cause, they say therefore that cause must have determined when to initiate its effect. And that is you. a property of will. That's the reason right. why they say that. Okay. Yeah. But I think Hamza gotcha. wants to move on. Sorry, Hamza. It's been lovely no, no, I just think he's, I think he's too nice for the arena, to be honest. <laughs> and if he stays, he's going to get bashed up again. It's, so, it's nice for a change, Hamza. Yeah, uh, it's, uh... Nice to have a nice, it's nice to have a nice guest. <laughs> exactly. um, we don't want to scare him away. And I think you, Jake, Yusuf, and uh, Abdurrahman um, will deal with all his concerns. And then we'll bring him back for his shahada. Inshallah. This boy really is doing Muslim. He just doesn't realize it. You're a nice guy, Trev. Guys. Don't be afraid Thanks. of Islam, bro. It, 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 it's the making of you. And you always have to stumble over all these answers. And All right, dude. Take care, yeah, my man. Cheers, man. Okay. All right. Bye, thank man. you, mate. Yeah, I, I've got Rob waiting for Daniel Hatke. Oh, please. No, no. I, I, for Daniel. We'll let, we'll let Daniel deal <laughs> you, with him. You will do that to Daniel, really? I, I, yeah, I think I so. I thought you liked him. Oh, <laughs> yeah, let Daniel sack him about a bit. You know who Rob is, don't you, Daniel? You know or not? The uh, this guy called Rob, he comes on with some utter nonsense. We pull his pants down, give him a spanking, then kick him out. So I'm going <laughs> to allow you the pleasure to do it. Um, let's just deal with this. I think this next guy is an Arab Christian. Um, I, I think. have to go pray soon, so I'll just come back. Yeah, inshallah. Don't worry. I'll, all right. If you want to go pray, I'll save Rob for you. Don't worry. All right. Um, yeah, mate. You're muted. I thought, was, I thought he said he was Jewish. No? Mr. Hebrew, you, you, you're muted. You need to yep. unmute your mic. Unmute your mic. The clue is in the word unmute. All right, I'll give you one last chance. I don't like the way you keep changing your camera. I will keep your camera fixed, please. And can you unmute your mic? Five, four... Three, two, one. Adios. Old Wolf. How's it going, everybody? All right, mate. How are you doing? Well, I'm doing all right. Hi. I have a few issues. I'm going to make it quick. I'm not going to waste everybody's time. A um, few problems that we have here. The first one that I want to throw in there, which is Hamza telling an atheist a while ago, I saw it on YouTube, saying that he, the guy is a kafir, and he said that Surat al-Kafirun is talking about him. Yeah. Whoa, whoa, stop, 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 stop. Go ahead. Say that again. You called an atheist kafir. I yeah. called an atheist a kafir? Yes. When? On YouTube. You call him a kafir. I don't call anyone a kafir. You actually did. No, I don't. There is a video that I can actually show it to you, send it to you to, to your email. When, when did I do this? Um, I can look up the date on YouTube. I can. Uh, where did I do this? Uh, by the corner of speech speechers, I think. Right. That's just an assign your logic. I don't call people kafir. It's not my language. Anyway, so yeah. I call I called someone a disbeliever. Yeah, go on. You said that the Surat al kafirun is talking about you, and you recited the whole surah in Arabic, and even the guy said, "How do I know what?" So I, I recited surah. So just so I understand. Yeah. So you're saying I recited Surat al kafirun to an unbeliever, yeah? Yes, an atheist. An unbeliever, yes? Yes. Right, okay, what's your point? So an atheist is actually not a kafir. Uh, in, in the Quran language, it's called he is calling, or they are called uh, mujrimun, which is... Is he a believer or an unbeliever? He is an atheist. Is he a believer or an unbeliever? In Arabic, it doesn't matter what you call in English. No, no, is he a believer or is he an unbeliever? English, you can call him whatever you want. Is he a believer? Does he believe in Allah or is he, he disbelieve in Allah? He doesn't believe, no. That's your answer. Right, so Surat al-Kafirun applies to him. No, What's it's your point? Not. You know why? Because what you are saying is saying that using the Quran, you're using God's word. To What's your point? I'm proving my point. If you can wait a minute, then you will... No, listen. no, no, no. Don't prove your point. Make your point and then prove your point. What's your point? Uh, okay, I'm making my point. I'm saying, why would you use God's word in something that's not in its place? 
So I okay, I would use Surat al kafirun for anyone who doesn't believe in Islam. Uh, that is right, yes. Right, so what's your point? So, because um, if you want to call a person who is an atheist a kafir, that doesn't apply because kafir, the atheists in, in Quran, in a Quranic language, they are called mujrimun. That's my first point. Second point, uh, it's actually about a... Uh, I, I've never no, hold on, that. hold on. Before I've you go never... to the second point, what is your definition of a kafir? A kafir, anybody could be a kafir. I'm, I could be a kafir. You could be no, a kafir. No, no, what's your definition of kafir? Uh, many meanings. You... Give, me, give me the most uh, prominent meaning of the term kafir in the context of what you just mentioned with regards to Brother Hamza and Surat al-Kafirun. Kafir is actually the one who is, it's actually a close to an English word, which is cover. Someone who covers something with something. That's the literal meaning. What's the meaning in the context of the words, exactly. uh, sorry, of, of your argument? Because uh, in Quran, there is, if you want to put it in context, for yeah. example, it could say, um, kufar which means he's talking about villains, you know, those farmers who put the seed underneath the ground. No, no, we aren't talking about the literal meaning. Come on, you, we, we both know that. We are not talking about farmers here. Mm -hmm. Okay, you mentioned Surah Al-Kafirun. So I want to know, based on that verse itself, sorry, based on that chapter of the Quran, uh -huh. what is the context, in that context of that surah, what is the term kafir mean? Meaning people who are applying their religion into another religion covering with falsehood. So they're, they're covering... What? They're no, covering. It's, it's basically those people who reject the Creator, reject Allah. Okay? Do atheists reject God? That is not correct. No, no, answer my question. Do the atheists reject God? They don't believe... They don't? They don't believe in God. They don't believe that means they reject God, right? They reject God. If they reject God, that means that... Halas, they... yalla, that's it. Okay, that's it. If they so, reject well, God, they are kafir. By definition yeah. of the word, no. that they, they might know about all this reality, where it comes from. They might. Let me ask you another question. Do, would you consider an atheist to be a mushrik? No. Why not? No. Allah what? says in the Quran, we take their desires as the as the ilah. What is mushrik? Someone who associates with God. That is incorrect. Okay, what is mushrik then? Tell me. You tell me, you are the scholar. Someone who does shirk, he's a mushrik. No, because you know what he no? does? Did he just say no? Sorry, did he just say no? I said no. no. Okay, so what is what is shirk then? Let's define that. My, my point is, listen, the reason why I waited for uh, more than an hour to talk to you guys, because this yeah. one, you're putting five, six words, giving it the same meaning, and it doesn't work like that. I gave you two words, kafir no, and no, no, mushrik. No, no. Okay, I, don't exaggerate. Can I make my point? No, I'm not talking about you. <laughs> Not right now. You said well, someone who's an atheist is not a mushrik. And I want to know why. Because if the term shirk means to associate partners with Allah, that, which you denied, I don't know why. The, the, the term shirk is understood by all scholars when they actually do the tafsir of the Quran to be simply associating any okay. deity with any other deity with God Almighty. Okay? So, for example, the... Uh, the mushriks or the pagans uh, of Arabia, they they might have believed in uh, Almighty God, but along with that, they associated other gods and other deities with him. Hence, they are mushrik. Similarly, there are people who say that their uh, desires are the ilah. So that is a form of shirk as well. And hence, the atheists, as I would say, is one of the top categories of mushriks. And this is from the scholars, you know, you can go and read from them. Just because you come it and is. use English terms and try to say, oh no, this doesn't mean that, and trying to take the literal meaning of the term uh, kafir as someone who covers like a farmer, yeah, it's not going to work because Surat al-Kafirun is very, uh, it's it's very clear as to what whom is talking about, wh whom Allah is talking about. And this is something that all scholars with ag ag uh, agree. If you look at any tafsir, are you they will all explain the same are, thing. Are you a kafir? Sorry? Are you a kafir? Am I a kafir? Yeah. Depends on your definition of kafir because you seem to have uh, brought it to just a farmer covering something. I'm asking you a question, which is pretty. Clear. No, no, he's not I'm, kafir. I no. am a Muslim because I do not, I do not reject Allah. I believe and I actually oh. do the will of Allah. So hence, I'm a Muslim. Okay. Are you a Muslim, old wolf? You guys, do you are you kafir? Are you a Muslim? 
You know, your definition of this is a this is a weird this is a really weird conversation. There's a Lugawi meaning, there is an Estalahi meaning, there's a Shari'i meaning, right? So you can't just switch the categories whenever you want and then turn it back when Hashim. We're Muslims. The Quran uses the word kafir in a Sharia sense. If you attribute any of that to Allah, to anything that is within the creation, you're a kafir and you're a mushrik by definition. This is not a problem for us. Why are you stuck in these meaningless definitions when it's clear to us? What is Especially the point? Surat al-Kafirun is clear, it doesn't man. make sense. When, when, yeah, sorry. when you make it a personal opinion, I have no problem with that. But as soon as you say, God said that and he means that, then that's my problem. You know okay, what? Do you 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 what do you is believe? It? What is your perspective coming from? I'm, what is your authority to speak on the Quran? I'll tell you why. Because, for example, there's another um, passage where it says... Can, can you answer what your perspective comes from? Like, are you a Muslim? You I'm a believer. I believe in God. Are you a in Muslim? What? In I'm what? Be I believe in God's existence. Are you a Muslim? Yeah, but... I believe that he's one and only. I believe that he's the most powerful. Do you believe Muhammad is his messenger? Peace and blessings be upon him. Huh? I believe in that, yes. You do believe Muhammad is his messenger? I believe last in Muhammad's messenger. What? Last. I believe in all of his messengers. I believe in him and I believe in his existence. So you're a Muslim? I'm a believer. Right. So what are you doing on the stream? The streams for non-Muslims? Non-Muslims, yeah. According to your uh, definition, because... Definition of, of your uh, companions, they would say whoever do specific things like rejecting hadith is not a Muslim. Are you a Muslim? Yes, I am. Alhamdulillah. Salam alaikum. <laughs> he, he disqualified himself from the arena. <laughs> this arena is for non Muslims, man. Why are Muslims going on here? <laughs> no, I think he was, right. a, he was one of those people which I don't like to call them Quranis, they're hadith rejectors. And he's right, we wouldn't consider them to be Muslim. Yeah. So anyway, um, whatever we do, I think it was, uh, he came with uh, accusing the Hamza about the term kafir. He wouldn't agree with the definition of kafir. I mean, I don't know where he's coming from. Anyway, next. <laughs> oh, Rob. <laughs> Salam. Salam. I'm looking forward to this. I really <laughs> Salam alaikum. <laughs> Can you, hear me? <laughs> can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear. Loud and clear mate. Good to see you, Hashim. Good to see you. I'm going to be yeah. down at Speaker's Corner as soon as I can. I've had some health issues. That's why I haven't been down. Uh, good to see you, Darren, back from Turkey. I've been following some of your your uh, you know your podcasts and stuff with uh, Mr. Rob, Fontaine. Rob, Rob, you follow everything. I'm in the shop, I put a link out, and you're in the back chat. Straight away, back Yeah, a lot of say, right? Whatever, yeah. whatever stream I'm doing, you're there, Rob. We know that. You're stalking me. We get it. Go on. Carry on. Due, due to, like I say, due to health issues, I've got, I've got some time on my hands at the moment. So, And uh, hi, Jazz. How are you? Hope you're okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm and, always um, great when I see you. I, I want to introduce you to my friend, Daniel Hakikatu. <laughs> wonderful guy. Wonderful guy, Rob. I think you'd really like to have a conversation with him, personally. So we're going to allow just a, you. So your question just a guy, is Daniel. Yeah, okay. I'll give, I'll give the question to Daniel. Daniel, um, is your father... Uh, have you, are, are, is your father still around? Is he still alive, your father? Yes. Oh, good, good. Now, if you was at home with your father, and in the morning, your father said to you, you can do what you like, you can believe what you like, no problem, okay? You go out the house, you come back in the afternoon, and your father punches you, and you look at him very puzzled. Why did you punch me? Why did you do that? Because you have to believe in what I believe in. Is that a contradiction? In the morning, he said to you, you can do what you like, believe what you like. That's up to you. I would ask you, Daniel, is that a contradiction? He said he punches you for what you express a belief. Well, this is it. You know, he, he punches you and says, you've got to believe in what he believes in and follow what he follows. But in the morning, he, he said to you, you do what you want. You believe what you want. So what I'm asking you, Daniel, is that a contradiction? Yeah, from the way you describe it, it seems like a contradiction. 
It is, isn't it? It is. It is. Okay. So what I would do is I, would, I whilst reading the Quran, I came across this contradiction. So in Quran 2, 256, we have the verse that says, do what you want. You can follow what you want. Brilliant. I totally agree. I totally agree. We then, we then go fast forward to Quran 929. What's going on, Daniel? I'm going to fight you until you believe in Allah. Is that contradiction, Daniel? So you're talking what about you La Ikraha Fiddin yeah. and Surah Al Baqarah. Yeah, so yeah. That, if you read the Quran, there is no view that you can believe whatever you want. You can believe that God doesn't exist. You can believe that Muhammad wasn't a messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You can believe that it's okay to kill people. It's okay to rape people. It's okay to, you know, commit blasphemy. It's in, uh, okay to plunder. If you believe that it's okay to plunder and pollute and murder, then that's fine. That's up to your belief. That's not what la ikraha fid deen means. What can we take? What what does uh, Quran two two fifty six mean to you? Well, there it doesn't matter what it means to me. It matters what scholars have said about. Well, it does. It does because that's Allah speaking. So you should really respect Allah, shouldn't you? Yeah, it means that faith is so obvious and clear. So I just read it. Let me let me be. Yeah, yeah, please, please, Darren. Please, Darren. Yep, go ahead. Go ahead. Is no. So this is one translation. Sahih International. There will be no compulsion and acceptance of the religion. The right course has become distinct from the wrong. So whoever disbelieves in Tawhut and believes in Allah has grasped the most trustworthy handhold with no break in it. And Allah is all hearing and knowing. So what is true, what is haq, what is the truth is very clear from what is wrong and what is false. So you, I don't need to force someone by knife and say, believe, otherwise I'll kill you. There's no need for that because the truth is so obvious. So whoever rejects, okay, so let's read Quran nine twenty nine. Let's read Quran nine twenty nine. Don't interrupt me. No, no, stick whoever, to this one. No, 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 no. We're not done with this verse yet. Yeah, exactly. So whoever rejects the truth of God's existence and Him sending messengers throughout time and the Quran, whoever rejects this, it's purely out of a fault of his own. It's a moral fault. It can be a rational fault, but he's accountable for that. That's what this verse means, as has been explained by scholars throughout history. Yeah, let me read it in its entirety. Um, I'm going to read from the clear Quran, if you don't mind, Daniel. Sure. Um, this is 2256. Let there be no compulsion in religion, for the truth stands out clearly from falsehood. So whoever renounces false gods and believes in Allah has certainly grasped the firmest unfailing handhold. And that Allah is all hearing, all knowing. Allah is the guardian of the believers. He brings them out of darkness and into light. As for the disbelievers, their guardians are false gods who lead them out of light and into darkness. It is they who will be the residents of the fire. They will be in there forever. So Allah is basically saying, look, this is the truth. No one can force you to accept it. It's pretty obvious what the truth is. And if you choose to reject it, then take the consequences, take your medicine. So beautiful, idea... beautiful, beautiful verse, beautiful verse. Absolutely yeah. lovely, lovely, lovely verse. Now let's right. fo fast forward to Quran 929, please. Right, so what, no, before we move on to, to Quran 929, what, what's that verse saying? Yeah, no compulsion in religion. You know, what if you want to accept... What's it, what's it saying? What's it saying? No, you... If you want to, if you want to become a Muslim, brilliant. You know, some Muslims have told me, oh, it's been abrogated. Well, I would argue if that's been abrogated, did Alan make a mistake? That he, you know, uh, uh, he he would give a verse and then, no, that's that's a mistake. So, you know, Quran nine twenty nine is something completely different. So what Allah so makes mistakes, Rob, Rob? Rob, with all due respect, what you have just done is you have only taken a fraction of that verse and then you have interpreted the entire thing. When you read the verse in context, it's talking about acceptance of the religion. There's no compulsion. So, for example, if somebody wanted to convert to Islam uh, by coercion or by force, that is something Allah does not permit. Whereas the, Thank you. The very, Thank you. If you look, at, you. If you look you. at the the very next sentence to that, like Quran 15, it says, The right course has become clear from the wrong. 
Yes? فمن يكفر بالتاغوت. You know what is تاغوت? I've heard of it. I can't remember. I've heard of it. Okay, I can't so, remember. So ta- tagood is basically, uh, it's, it's, it's a way of defining all the false deities. So whether you are a star believer, a stone believer, a fire worshiper, whatever it is, all the false, you know, idol worshiper, all these false deities are tagood. So if you disbelieve in these false deities, yes, mm, mm. and believe in Allah, then you have grasped the most trustworthy handhold. With no break in it. So Allah is giving you the condition of what He will accept from you as true belief in the true believer, the true creator, and for you to then reject all the false beliefs. So you have to, what you have just done here is you have looked at the very first, uh, the beginning of that verse, not even the full verse, and then you interpret, okay, no compulsion in religion, that's it, full stop. But the, you have to completely, you have to look at the full context and then Allah says, and Allah is the hearing and the knowing at the end. Yes. So he wants you to believe in Allah. It's not like Allah is telling, okay, there's no compass in religion and that's it. You know, you do what you want. Allah has told you in the very same sentence, in the very same verse, that you reject the tagut, all the false deities, and you accept only Allah as your Lord and as your as 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 a creator and as the Lord as as the the only God worthy of worship. Does it make sense to you, Rob? I mean, I know what you're saying. Okay, but so what, you, what is the problem? You know, then? You, you have the words. You have the words. What now, is the problem? The words, I want to you know have... based on this what what is the problem? What is your contention with this particular verse in the Quran? Two. Two five six in Surah Al-Baqarah. Okay, okay. So you have the words "no compulsion in religion," which I absolutely, absolutely, uh, not a hundred, a thousand percent agree with. A thousand percent agree with. What about the rest and, of it? You know what? What about the rest of it? No, no. But even that, I think we need to dissect. Like, you don't believe in any kind of compulsion, Rob. Like, um, what, about, what about the uh, government? Can a government? Uh, force people to believe, you know, in certain things because you have a public education system that it has a very set curriculum according to whatever the government defines it to be. And children are required by law. There, there's a compulsion for them to go to school and to study that curriculum set by the secular governments. Um, is that compulsion good or bad? Governments will present you with evidence and learning but they won't force you to accept it if they do you will be talking about something like communism no what okay. about, what about in the, you're you're in the uk right yeah yes yeah so yep. what about for example this rse curriculum do people have a choice do schools uh, have a choice whether they want to ch- teach the uh, sex lgbt curriculum they can they can certainly uh, study it at school. After they leave school in the evening, they don't have to adhere to those beliefs. But they are required. There is a compulsion for children in the UK to study that curriculum. Or in Germany. Yeah, I, re- I, re- I refer to my, my answer that I just gave. Your answer didn't make sense because you skirted the issue. Yeah. Well, you can leave school. You can leave school at five p.m. You can leave school at five p.m. and forget all about it and, and not practice it. You're not. You're not no, thinking you're about children, it. You've, you've just left it. In, you've left it in the classroom. You've left it in the no. classroom. The point. But is religion. That, sorry, religion sure. is twenty four seven. Religion is twenty four seven. There is a compulsion on children to learn a certain <laughs> curriculum. You think that's wrong? You think that there uh, should be compulsion or not? For children to be exposed to this curriculum and be taught that this is right, this is wrong. You, you, you've changed the topic. You, you've changed the topic. You've changed the topic. No, he's talking about compulsion. It's an argument by analogy, Rob. It's the same topic. Okay, let's let's take another example, Rob. Are you compelled to obey the traffic laws if you want to drive a car in in anywhere in the world? Um. Everybody, arguably, everybody has to observe the laws, uh, but, they, but they, they have to observe. They have to observe the laws, but they're free to break them. 
You know, no, you where is, where is, does it where is punished, you they to, does, do they enforce the law or not? Well, you're, you're free to break the law, but obviously no, there's that wasn't my question. Does the government force you to keep the law? They, they don't force you. They present you with the law. So you can they, break the... They, you can, they, you tell can you, they, they usually tell you what the law the is. And, and the law they usually tell not, you what the law is. Rob? Rob, you need to listen well, to a question. If you are a driver anywhere in the world and red traffic light means for you to stop, and if you drive through the red traffic light... Do you think the law will not force you or not to hold you accountable for doing so, for breaking the you law? You could drive, well, you could drive through the red light, but obviously there'll be consequences. Yeah. Will uh, okay. they, what is the consequence that you'll be forced by law not uh, to do that, right? Well, you'll probably receive a fine. You'll probably receive a fine. Oh, no, you, but, can, you can receive a jail sentence. You can receive a lot of things, okay? Not just a fine. Uh, even, a, even a fine. Why? Yeah, can I just... You're so, just sorry, can I just respond? Yeah, sure. Why, why, like I say, why Daniel's question is um, not relevant is because you can leave school at 5 p.m. And if you've been taught about LGBT, you can just forget it. You can discard it. No, no, you, you missed the point. I, I, you, can't. you can, Rob, you know, you Rob, can. You, you, you but can't with, stop with religion, class. that's the point. With the religion, point with religion, it's twenty four seven. It's twenty four seven. Sweden. Let's talk about Sweden. So kids will go to school. There's a set state curriculum by the government. Then children go home. But guess what? There are social workers in Sweden who. Can you can you hear me? Yeah. 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 So there are social workers who will come and visit your home and will question the children and will question the parents and make sure that you are not teaching your children hatred as they define it. You are not teaching your children anything that is violent, according to, to their definition. So, yes, it is a compulsion. The whole idea of public education, according to the Enlightenment thinkers, people like David Hume, people like John Locke, Jean Jacques Rousseau, their whole idea of public education is that you want to form the beliefs of the public to enlighten them. That's the whole point of enlightenment. So you have to sometimes com uh, compel people through compulsion in order to be enlightened, in order to create the utopia that is envisioned by these enlightenment liberal thinkers. So they, the whole good, good, good. Welcome to Islam and welcome to communism. D Daniel, Daniel, it's not even just reason. Sweden. So just really quick, it's not even just Sweden. In the UK, it's the same thing. We have something called the prevent duty under the CVE, countering violent extremism, which means that if a child goes at home, expresses things which are perceived to go against British values or perceived to be quote-unquote extreme, like, for example, being critical, overly critical of LGBT, even in the privacy of their own home, then the schools are under a statutory obligation to inform a prevent officer and raise the level. And then a prevent officer, like a police officer, can go knocking on a person's door, a child's door, at the privacy of their own home, after school, question the, uh, the child's parents, question the child, it, uh, privately and put them on what they call uh, a prevent program where they will try to de-radicalize them i through a process of indoctrination so rob you live in a state today called britain which actually enforces certain set of values within the masses of the people and in fact david cameron and this is what he said if i can just bring up the quote he was asked. To, he was basically uh, asked about the issue of. Uh, um, let me just quickly get it for you. About he he. This is what he said. He goes for too long. We have been a passively tolerant society, saying to our citizens, "As long as you obey the law, we will leave you uh, leave you alone." This is what David Cameron was saying, and then he says it is often meant we have stood neutral between different values. His argument was an argument for what he called muscular liberalism, the idea of pushing a set of values and preventing a other set of values that contradicts it. So this idea that there is no compulsion within Western societies or Britain, the country that you live in today, you're, you're living in cloud cuckoo land, yeah? And so everything that you're talking about, about the Quran says this, Quran says that, why aren't you as vociferous 
against the policies like the CVE prevent policy. Completely in the wrong. UK. I, I'm sorry. I, I respect you know you as a person, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what you've just said is completely wrong. Really? You know, completely wrong. Nobody, really? nobody, nobody is forced not to be a terrorist, as we have this witnessed is not to do many, with many. As this we is not have to witnessed. Do with terrorism. Well, prevent is about terrorism, is it not? No, to that, no. no prevent is preventing extremism, yeah? That's yes, which called. leads to terrorism. That's no, why they no. would introduce preventing it. Preventing extremism. So what they would say, this is one police officer, uh, one senior police officer, I, I'll get his name later on. He argued, he said, if you notice in a child certain behavioural traits, like, for example, change in dress, believing alcohol is haram, no longer celebrating Christmas, then these are signs for extremism. Now, none of those things are related to violence. None of those things are related to uh, being intolerant even of somebody else, yeah, or, you know, being a hatred to somebody else. None of those things are related to any criminal acts. It's a, st these are all it's a straw man. To, it's a complete straw man. Related to it's a complete thoughts. straw man. These are all related to thoughts and these ideas which they think clashes with quote unquote British values, yeah. You know, you need to, you, honestly, well, you've not, you're not understand. aware of this. He doesn't yeah, understand the point. He just wants to deny that there is a. It's yeah. very obvious what the complete analogy. straw man. Can, I mean, look, if, if, we, if we can move on to Quran nine twenty nine, you will see the contradiction. Everybody say goodbye to Rob. Bye bye, yeah. Rob. Rob. Nine twenty nine, Quran nine twenty nine is the contradiction. Goodbye, 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 Rob. Uh, we can, can, I just we can address. We can address. We should address nine twenty nine. Actually, yeah. we should. Can I just? Yeah, but we don't need Rob there bumbling about. Yeah. Can I just point out that Zechariah chapter fourteen mandates that all those who oppose Yahweh's religion will be mandated and forced to come to Jerusalem every year and participate in religious uh, 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 ceremonies. And if they don't. Yahweh will send curses upon them. He will destroy their nations. This is by definition forced worship. So, Rob, why be a hypocrite when you happily believe in your fat slob self that in the future people like us will suffer and that we don't have free will to choose? Why are you playing these games? I don't understand. It does. Is, he a, is he a Christian? Sorry. Yeah, no, Rob yeah. is a Christian. Yes. Oh, I didn't know. <laughs> so then, why, why, is he, why is he speaking like a liberal? Secularist. Yeah. He's a liberal yeah. when he's on Hamza's den, and when he's Christian, he's in the park. That that's the way it works. Yeah. So obviously, we know that the Old Testament affirms orders of executing apostates. <laughs> According to him, that's Jesus affirming that. So you know, I, I'll just quote that: Deuteronomy three six uh, three six. If your brother, the son of your mother, your son or your daughter, the wife of your bosom or your uh, bosom or your friend who is, uh, as your own soul, secretly entices you, saying, let's go and serve other gods which you have not known, neither you nor your father of the gods of the, uh, of the people which are all around you, near to you or far off of you, from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth. You shall not consent to him or listen to him, nor shall you, your eye pity him, nor shall you spare him or conceal him, but you shall surely kill him. Your hand shall be the first against him to put him to death and afterward the hand of all people. And this person's talking about how he's this liberal, tolerant individual. If he's a Christian and he believes, therefore, in the Old Testament, even if he doesn't believe these verses apply, apply today because Christianity's abrogated them. Yeah, God changed his mind, apparently, and he's got a problem with that as well. But even if he thinks that, he's, he at the very least has to acknowledge that God had, according to his perspective, legislated and said it was moral. Sharif, Psalm 119, verse 116, all your laws are righteous and eternal. They're eternal, they're not temporary. He, he'll happily believe that same thing will happen when Christ returns to kill all of us. That's his belief. So I don't know where he's sitting comfortably at home thinking he can call us these names and it equally even worse applies to him. Here's my challenge to anyone like Rob. Think about it. Can you give me a verse that says, Kill everything that breathes in the Quran. No, but I can give you one in the Bible. So what are you arguing about? I don't understand. Sorry. Daniel, do you want to deal with... Um, 929. Yeah. Yeah, so... Shall I read it? Yeah, go ahead, read it. Okay. Surah Tawbah. 
Yeah. So fight those who do not believe in Allah and the last day, nor comply with what Allah and his messenger have forbidden, nor embrace the religion of truth from among those who were given the scripture until they pay the tax, willingly submitting, fully humbled. Yeah, so this, first of all, doesn't say uh, force the people of the book to believe, right? Because they're going to be paying jizya in the first place. So there's no compulsion for Ahlul Kitab uh, to believe in Islam. They would just be under Islamic law and paying jizya, which we know is, is the tax, and they become Ahlul Dhimma, the protected people, and they're able to practice their religion um, and have their churches, their synagogues, um, without Muslims forcing them to convert. So this is not even a, even with his wrong argument, uh, his wrong interpretation of uh, in Surah Al-Baqarah, La Ikraha Fiddin, even with his wrong interpretation, it does not contradict this verse which is about Ahlul Kitab. And the context of this verse also is important. This was when the Romans actually were planning to come and fight and attack the Muslims. And, you know, after this ayah, the Prophet ﷺ went to the battle of Tabuk, but the Romans didn't actually show up for that battle. So that battle didn't happen. But this principle is laid out regarding Ahlul Dhimma, the people who are protected, as well as the jizya and um, so forth. And just so people understand it, what jizya is. It's only is. took him less than a minute to explain that. I mean, he spent like 15 minutes with Rob trying to get to that one point. SubhanAllah. But just to explain what jizya is, jizya is the tax that's paid uh, by the non-Muslims living in a, a Islamic state. Only men of military age pay it. Old people don't pay it. Children don't pay it. Women don't pay it. And it exempts them from being part of the army. And of course, they don't pay zakat, where the Muslims do pay zakat. So, yeah, And they can the still be given the protection and exempted from oh, yeah, the yeah, of if course. the ruler wills not. SubhanAllah. All right. Um, I Hamza, don't just as a quick point as well. Some, uh, a brother, some brothers that I know of uh, from Stoke, they did, uh, uh, they did a comparison basically between UK taxation compared to jizya yeah so they gave an example of a person who earns around about forty thousand pounds per year has savings of thirty thousand uh, pounds and under under basically british uh, taxation system he'd be paying over twelve thousand pounds worth of tax uh, that didn't include uh, other aspects of taxes but that's just twelve thousand pounds but under jizya that same person would be uh, paying one thousand four hundred and three pounds in tax so it shows you from over twelve thousand pounds in our system today to uh, fourteen hundred pounds. Yeah, so it's a big difference. Yes, subhanallah. All right, um, Mister the Root. I uh, don't know if it's a Muslim or not. Sheikh Mustasim. I'm assuming is a Muslim. Anyway, let's see. Mister the Root. Let's see what you're all about. Allo. Hello. 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 Can you, can you guys hear me? Well, yeah, we can. Time, so yes, we can. Hello. Can, can, uh, can, Hi, can, can you, you hear us? We can hear you. Can uh, you hear okay. Me? Uh, yes, yes. I can hear Good. you guys. Um, actually, uh, I have a question about uh, slavery. Okay. Is it? Okay. Uh, it's about in uh, about about a verse in Surah Al Muminun, uh, verse uh, uh, five to six. Are you Muslim, by the way? Are you yeah, Muslim? Are you Muslim? Uh, I'm not a Muslim. Uh, actually, I don't. Uh, I don't have any. Uh, okay. I don't have any religion. Uh, so okay. Uh, All right, you know, Muslim, the, What's Surah? Not Muslim. What's Surah? Uh, surah, surah, surah al-Mu'minun. Uh, surah 23, uh, verse uh, 5, to, 5 to 6. All right, one second. Five to surah six. 23, 5 to 6. Oh. Uh, yes. Okay, bismillah. Um, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Successful indeed are the believers, those who humble themselves in prayer, those who avoid idle talk, those who pay alms tax, those who guard their chastity except with their wives or their bondswomen in their possession, and for them they are free from blame. But whoever seeks beyond that are the transgressors. Wait, go on, which point? Okay, uh, my, 
my question is uh right hand process is actually uh is slave am i right no yes. it's not it's not. Can't, can't you buy an edge <laughs> I, I wouldn't say slave in the context of slave you're trying to say it captives uh, of war let's put it that way yeah captives of war yep captives of war. okay uh can you can you guys maybe uh briefly uh explain to me what uh, verse five and six are, are are talking about. I mean, the uh, guarding the private parts. Is it is it mean sex? Uh, is it so refer those to, who guard their to... chastity, except with their okay. wives or those bondswomen in their possession? So they they don't have sex with anyone apart from the the captives of war. Yeah, the, the what the right hand possesses and or their wives. Yeah, what's your point? Okay, so in these two verses, uh. Muslim uh, uh, is allowed to have sex with uh, uh, with his wife and his uh, right hand possess, which is a uh, war captive. Yes, yeah, um, halal for yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the war captive is halal for him. Yes. Yes. What's your point? I, I got uh, a question for you, Mister. What, what what's, 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 what's your Mister. Iki's point is? What's your point? Oh, uh, actually, I I uh, uh, I'm curious about the the uh, the the problem of uh, consent. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, when they, uh, because I, I, I always heard some Muslims say that when they ha uh, have sex with, uh, before they have sex with the war captive, they have to get the consent from the war captive. Um, is it, is it right? Well, one second, one second, one second. You brought sort of five, six. What's your point? Uh, yes, uh, yes. Uh, my, my point is about the, the, the consent. I mean, well, if a Muslim... Does, you know, uh, okay, but there he doesn't mention consent. So why did you bring these verses? Uh, because these verses uh, shows that uh, a believer can have sex with a war captive, right? No, it's saying, yeah, so, yeah, so it's basically saying it's permissible for him to have sex with this particular woman, yes. Okay. What's okay, okay. Point? So now, now, my, now my, my question is, uh, is it consent... Uh, Require when the uh, when the Muslim want, uh, want to have sex with the with the war captive, does he need to get the like consent from the war war captive? Right. Are you saying is he allowed to rape her? Uh, no, no, no. Actually, I I am still learning, so I. No, uh, but that is your claim. Rape. If you That's said that there's no consent, then you're saying that it is rape. Uh, I'm not sure. That's why I asked the question at here. Go on, Daniel. So, so, Go yeah, not necessarily. Like there, are the definition of consent, the definition of rape, um, these things are highly contested. And so now you have a definition of consent uh, that is taught in universities, actually, uh, because they're trying to fight the quote unquote rape culture. And they say that in an act during the act of sex, sorry for being very graphic here, but during the act of sex, Every single change in position or touch or kiss during the act, like every time you want to do something, you need to verbally ask for consent and you need to receive verbal yes for every single thing that you do. Otherwise, that is sexual assault and you could be put into prison. And it, just to be clear, uh, Brother Daniel, it can't be just one yes. It has to be multiple because they could change their mind after the kiss, right? Yeah, they can yeah. any second they could change their mind and they might not express it because they're they feel, you know, threatened, like threatened yeah. right? So they have to verbally express it every and I guess it's conventionally thought that the woman is the one who has to express consent, but what about the guy? He also has to say yes for every single second. And so this is the this is the view of what constitutes real consent, meaningful consent according to um, the woke definition and what is considered rape i mean i mean, I mean uh, when i say consent i mean uh, uh consent is like uh agree uh i mean uh agree like uh, the woke captive he said okay yes i i'm i uh, i'm okay i agree to uh to have sex with you i mean the consent uh yeah like well, something well, like agreement well 
we can contextualize this historically. Uh, for example, are you concerned about what happens when non-Muslim armies invade countries? You had the rape of Baghdad. I don't mean to be graphic. The rape of Berlin. You look at these things. Islam seems to provide a solution for this problem, and it manages the urges that men, fighting men, would typically have. And so it's not as if we can simply go out there and grab a woman and claim her for the night and do whatever I want. There's a rule and there's a process to go through with it. So for example, in a war zone, if a woman has a husband, that husband survives, then no, she can't become a captive. There are certain conditions which must be laid out. So at the end of the day, Islam just seems to systematically address the issue as opposed to leaving it open where people can do anything for any reason, especially in a period of conflict. So how do you deal with Islam's systematic dealing with it as opposed to, let's say, um, Western countries not having a systematic means of approaching the assault of women during war? Uh, actually, I'm still learning, so I uh, I don't know that much things uh, about. Uh, but I do know about the the I mean those uh, those things that you mentioned. Uh, mm -hmm. But but now I'm just curious about this. Uh, I mean the the war captive in Islam because I always heard Muslims say that. Uh, uh, they have to ask the consent from the from the war captives. Um, it doesn't make sense. Like I'll just come out and say it. The idea the captive have to, has to consent. It's just not meaningful. Like this is not a meaningful thing to say. Like it's like saying, "Oh, this is the person who is incarcerated in prison. Does he or she have to consent to being behind bars? Does he or she have to consent? You know, to come out." tell them to come out they're captives so asking if the captive can consent this is like a meaningless question and it really makes no sense yes because uh, uh being a captive is not a good like it's not a happy situation it's not a good situation but it's a necessary situation given the reality of war in the time of uh in the pre-modern period before uh modern war Geneva convention and, and nuclear weapons and you know carpet bombing war prior to the modern period was uh, required manpower the side that had the biggest army was going to win in most cases and so to have a bigger army you need to be able to produce warriors to go and fight and that requires wombs so wombs are critical for the survival of your people, of your nation. So you can go read any book on pre-modern warfare and they'll make this point that slavery and concubinage, you can use the word sex slavery, right hand possession, concubines, they all mean the same thing. You are required to have them if you want to survive in the war context because people are constantly attacking each other and attacking weaker, smaller groups in order to take their resources, kill them all, exterminate them. So if you don't want to be exterminated, when you go to war, you need to be able to take war captives, including uh, concubines. Okay, so I would take the answer as, uh, so the the answer would be the, the, con the consent is unnecessary, right? It, it's not meaningful. It's, it's like asking... The, does a prisoner in a jail have consent to stay in the in on, behind bars? Um, okay, okay, um, okay. Uh, I think you, you should look at the context of the surah. The surah is basically saying to stay away from unlawful sex. That is basically what he's saying. So hmm. your wives and these captives of war, the ones that have been allocated to you. So it's not just like uh, you go to the war and then you just pick any woman and then you have sex with her whenever you feel like. So there's a due process for this. So Allah is telling you to stay away from unlawful sex. Yes. So if you have sex with your wives and the, uh, the, the captives of war who have been allocated for you, then it will not be adultery or fornication. And these people will find favor with Allah on the day of judgment. That's all he's saying. I mean, it's so like if actual, you look at... Like yeah, sorry, go if you know, the people who live in a particular city that your country is at war with consent to being bombed and consent to being blown away with, you know, look at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, look at the carpet bombing of Dresden, look at chemical warfare in Vietnam. Did, 
Did the Vietnamese consent to Agent Orange being sprayed on the jungles of Vietnam, causing decades of birth defects? Did they consent to that? It's mm. war. Okay, I got it. I got it. Uh, and also, okay. it's not compulsory. You need to understand that this taking of captives of war is up to the leader. Yes. So, if they want to forego and like we are not going to take any captives or we're going to exchange our captives for their captives yes or a, or a ransom these are the other options also so don't think that is always like every war that the muslims fight they must have captives of war this is not a necessary condition okay so it it all depends on the on the on the, on the leader on the, yeah on the commander yeah the leader whoever is the amir Okay. okay. I can, uh, uh, yeah. Just on the, just on the issue though of, of this consent thing, because it's exactly what Daniel said. This term consent in the twenty first century is completely different to back in the day. Uh, Imam Shafi had something to say on this matter. That um, a quote. It says, um, "If he has only one wife or an additional concubine with whom he has intercourse, he is commanded to fit Allah Almighty and not to harm her in regards to intercourse. Although nothing specific is obligated upon him." He is only obligated to provide what benefits her, such as financial maintenance, residence, clothing, and spending the night with her. As for intercourse, its position is one of pleasure, and no one can be forced into it. So that's what Imam Shafi's position. He said. No, this is a, this is poor rap context, Hamza. I mean, I hate to. Is it? Yeah, fair uh, enough. It, this is not like the what you just said. Like it makes it seem like Imam Shafi is saying that you have a concubine and she can eat and sleep and enjoy your house. <laughs> and she's not obligated to do anything for you. And as long as she doesn't consent, then she can just sit there and enjoy your house and home and food and everything. This is not the Islamic view. I mean, we have to be very honest about what the rules and regulations are within our tradition. And yeah, I said um, obligation on him, not on her. I know exactly obligation on him, but there's obligation on her as well. Otherwise, it's just obligation. Who would want to just have some another mouth to feed? That's not yeah. that's not why anyone. No one would take a concubine then. <clears throat> like it's understood. Like, I mean, it's understood. This is the context of war. When you are defeated in war, whether whatever side you're on, you're on the Muslim side, you're on the non-Muslim side. Two non-Muslim groups are fighting. This is how war proceeded. In fact, the women in, in certain battles would actually go to the battlefield yeah, from the cities and they're just waiting who's going to be the winning side because it's obvious what's going to happen next. You're going to be part, as women, you're going to go to whoever is the winning side, whether it's your they side. To, or they used to wear their finest clothes, hoping to yeah, catch uh, the eye. Yeah, because that's, that's, that's understood about the nature of war. Are you, are you saying that... Uh, uh, during the time of the Prophet Muhammad, I mean, I mean the, during the during the war time of uh, Prophet Muhammad, are you saying that uh, women and children they normally will go to the battlefield? Sometimes. No, he's not saying that. He's not saying that. No, no. In in certain battles, you battles. not necessarily Muslim battles. Uh, I I can't think of a specific example, but in general, in battles at that time, prior to that time. Afterwards, basically in pre-modernity, pr prior to modern warfare, battles were happening where b two armies would meet. Okay, And sometimes they would just elect a champion to go and fight in the middle of whatever opening or clearing there was. And sometimes the champions would fight and whoever won, that meant that side won the battle. That was one type of uh, fighting that, that would occur. Other times, both sides would get at each other, kill each other, and usually the side that had the biggest army would win. Now, that's not always the case. Sometimes a more skilled, smaller army could overtake a larger army. But point remaining that numbers was critical. Having a bigger army was critical, and it was also understood that the, losing, the winning side would uh, take the women of the losing side. Winners would get the concubines. It was understood, and the obligations of what would come with that are also understood. We're also understood. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, to, things so, to try to, so try to, trying to pin this as some kind of moral failing of Islam is a ridiculous argument. We have oh, no. Okay. I have no problem saying that yes, in Islam there was 
concubinage, i.e. possession of women, i.e. sex slavery in Islam. And that's sanctioned. It's clear in the verses that you cited, Surat al-Mu'minun and elsewhere. It's called milk yamin. So this is a big discussion about like what is the meaning of slavery, what is the meaning of this and that. Fine. But the way to think about it very easily in a few words on a live stream is that this is a kind of weapon of war. This is something that you need to do in order to not be exterminated as a people. So it's morally, not only morally justified, it is morally necessary to take slaves, to take uh, captives of war, and specifically female captives of war. This is a moral obligation. And that's why no one has criticized in the pre-modern period these verses of the Quran. No one has criticized Islam. Christians weren't criticizing Islam. Jews weren't criticizing Islam. Oh, you guys are taking sex slaves. That's so barbaric. No one was criticizing Islam for this. Why? It's only the modern liberal West that criticizes Islam for this. And Christians who have been liberalized and Jews who have been liberalized and have basically thrown away their uh, books that also describe the same kind of rules of war. Those are the only people who are criticizing the Quran and Islam for this. Meanwhile, they are using all kinds of other weapons that are far more horrific, far more destructive than slavery, far more just terrifying than slavery and concubinage. So this is a hypocrisy. And if you look okay. at any civilization, you know, they all had slavery pre-industrial era, you know. It was mainly man force. Any work to be done, you know, building the pyramids, building the Great Wall of China, all these great, which we call them great wonders of the world today, they were built by slaves, you know. So this was a labor force at that time. You didn't have trucks and tractors and bulldozers and cranes at that point. So everyone had slaves. It's not like Islam has some sort of a monopoly. But what Islam did was it severely narrowed down the source of slavery. You know, before they could take anyone, before Islam, they could take anyone as a slave, a free man, a free woman, anyone. Islam narrowed it down to just the captives of war. Yes? And this is something that no civilization has done before. Yeah. And, there's a and remember, these people wanted to kill you. So anyone who's feeling sorry for these captives of war, don't forget, if the Muslims were the ones who lost, they would be suffering a fate much worse than that. Yes, because those people did not have any rights for the prisoners of war. Islam is the one which implemented these laws. Even the slaves had rights. So if I if I remember correctly, there's a hadith which says that if someone slaps a slave, they can be freed. Yes, and there are many passages in the in the hadith. Uh, sorry, uh, there are many narrations in the hadith. You know how to gradually like um, uh, free the slaves, not just capture them, but there are f uh, doing something to free a slave is is supposed to be something or rewarding. And this is something the companions practiced. So we have to take the whole picture into account. You can't just say living in the 21st century and then try to uh, judge everything based on our era from something 1400 years ago. But like Brother Daniel said, it's something that was uh, practiced. We, we do not deny that. And it's, it's something that we have to look at it from today's standard as well. Like I don't think of any wars today where the leaders say that, yes, we have to have captives of war. Maybe they have signed some tra treaties with um, uh, with all the countries not to have captives of war. I mean, that's another alternative. Like in Surah, Al Surah Muhammad, it says about ransoming this uh, captives of war as well. So that's another uh, option. So it's not just one way street that you only have captives and sla sex slaves and that's it. And even these captives of war, <laughs> their job wasn't just to have sex with you. Yes, they were used basically as labor as well. So they were used oh. for work in the household, outside the house as well. The, look at the uh, look at the picture holistically, rather than just in a very na narrow-minded way. Yeah, oh, okay, I was going to say okay. anybody who wants to see modern examples of what's being said here is there's a movie called Casualties of War, and it's um, Tom Cruise and Sean Penn, and it's about the comfort women in Vietnam, how the American soldiers used to go villages and used to take young women with them. And they would rape them along the way and then kill them. 
and um, basically Tom Cruise. Is it Tom Cruise or is it Michael J. Fox? I think it's Tom Cruise. And bas basically, <laughs> is it Tom Cruise? <laughs> Catch up, war. So basically, he wants to. No, it's Michael J. Fox. Sorry, I think. And anyway, so he wants to report it to his superior officers that what they're doing out in the field. And um, I won't give any spoilers, but that's just an example. Now, I don't see here any help cry about the American soldiers did in Vietnam to the women and such. You hear nothing. So the idea that you, you start stretching back here just shows you trouble causing, to be honest with you. All mm. right, mate. Uh, uh, Mr. Icky, are you, are you done now? Uh, uh, I have uh, actually uh, two more, two more <laughs> questions. Uh, I, think you, I think you're done. What's your, what's before, your question? What's before your you go, I just wanted to ask you, do you follow any religion? Uh, no, I don't follow any. Uh, 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 sorry. Uh, uh, actually, I have uh, uh, two more two more questions. Is it okay? No. What's your religion? Uh, I I have no I have no religion. So what's Do your, you what's your in God? source of morality? Uh, I believe uh, there is a uh, uh, there is a how to say. I believe there is a creator because um, I. I don't believe that the Earth and the, all the universe will just uh, uh, form into by itself. So I believe there is a creator, but I'm not sure which one. So uh, okay. have you looked? Uh, have you looked into Islam? Have you read the uh, Quran? Um, uh, not really deeply. Some, yeah. So uh, I mean, let me ask you this question: If you believe in the creator, yes. Do you think the okay. creator would just let you uh, exist without any purpose? Or do you think there's a purpose that you have as during your existence? I, I believe there is a purpose because uh, it is quite ridiculous to, to, to think that something exists without purpose. I think there's a purpose. No, Alhamdulillah. So what do you think is that purpose? What is your purpose? What is the purpose of your existence? I don't know. <laughs> Honestly, say, I really uh i really really don't know but uh i do believe you must uh, have given they, it some uh, thought come on uh sorry what you must have given it a thought you must have thought about it sometimes um maybe to <laughs> please the creator because uh normally people uh, get something obtain something to uh for the for for themselves purpose to to please themselves maybe Maybe my existence is to is is to please him. No, that's that's very good actually. Yeah. So what do you, how would you know what pleases the creator? Uh, Mr. Ashim, I'm sorry because I, I no, no, I, it's, you're, I you you you're already thinking the right way, brother. I'm not uh, just saying that. I mean it. How would you know? You know, in order for the creator to be pleased, obviously you need to be told how, right? Uh, uh, yes, so he yes. needs to communicate right. to you uh, like, yeah. what are the do's and don'ts so uh, do's yes. meaning what will please him and don'ts means what will displease him you know as the Muslims say halal and haram okay yeah you know about halal and haram uh, yeah I know I know, I know, okay. I know about uh, where are you from if you don't mind me asking uh, what, what sorry what, where are you from which country are you from uh, I'm from Malaysia. Oh, mashallah! So you're living amongst the Muslims. Uh, yeah. That's why I have uh, I have uh, Muslim friends. Yeah. So. Mm. Alhamdulillah. Uh, okay. You, you have ever read the Quran? Uh, just some of it. Not uh, yeah, just some some of it. Okay, alhamdulillah. I mean, you should you should read it, and I'm sure you have Muslim friends. They can help you. Lots of masajids in uh, Malaysia, inshallah. So, you know, the question I was going to ask you is that, look, uh, uh, we all are certain of one thing, that is death. So whether you believe in God, you disbelieve in God, you're an atheist, agnostic, whatever you are, everyone knows that one day we are going to die. Mm, okay. Yeah. Now imagine okay. a person who doesn't believe in God and they believe that they're going to die one day. And then there is nothing after that. You just become dust and that's it. That's the end of your existence. So if we all, let's say, for the sake of argument, believe that and we all become dust and there was nothing after life, then none of us have actually risked anything or 
had any pro- have any problem but if you look at the flip side that god does exist and afterlife does exist then who is taking the bigger risk here uh me yeah obviously okay so so what you should do my my brother is you know like do not take such a huge risk because this life is temporary and the afterlife is eternal yeah it's it's got no end so you really uh, need to prepare for that life and in order to do that find the purpose of your life find the purpose of your existence and you already said it correctly to please the creator and that's exactly what allah says in the quran yes that allah has created you to worship worship means obedience to god sorry you want to say uh, something good yeah uh, yes i uh, uh, actually i'm i'm in the process of searching so uh, i'm i'm not really okay. sure which one yes so i i'm, I'm still searching actually uh, my uh, i have another question i'm I, i'm sorry uh, Mr. Hashim, because uh, uh, I have the question that I I really want to know, but I'm not making any judgment now. I just want to know uh, about the um, uh, um. I don't mean to be impolite, okay? Just uh, just want to learn, no, no, just want to on, know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, because uh, when when uh, when I when I read the the, the hadith, I I came across some uh, some hadith uh, mentioned about the uh, prophet uh, trading the slave. Uh, uh this uh, hadith uh, saying that the prophet uh, trading can, can, can i just stop you a second okay okay you're looking into islam and you're obsessed with slavery what's going on <laughs> because uh, okay okay i will just what be what does it matter continue. what does it matter how does okay. that make islam untrue whether there were slaves or not okay i will just be honest because uh every every religion uh they teach about good things you know they they teach they teach people to uh to do uh good things to 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 treat people nicely and then they say uh, uh you will go to heaven but uh so i think i i uh i already know all those good things so what now i want to know what about slavery uh what what sorry what does christianity say about slavery or judaism or judaism uh, christianity actually um uh, if uh uh as what i have i have studied uh christianity allowed slavery in the old testament what okay. really what are you talking about the new testament new testament uh the the new testament uh it says be uh, obedient to your masters why would uh, a slave yeah. be obedient to the masters and what does it mean i i know that verse but actually a uh, new testament because uh, because in new testament there's a teaching about about love uh love your enemy so uh uh okay what do you mean love your enemy this the slave isn't your enemy it's your property so it doesn't apply that's why when yeah. paul he's writing to one of his colleagues he sends his slave back to him and asks him not to kill him the slave is onesimus so you can't say that that verse overrides the historical practice of christianity that would be a very strange Because... reasoning did paul not know that verse I'm curious. Okay, okay. Uh, uh-huh. uh, I, 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 I just want to be clear here. I'm, I, I'm not defending uh Christianity. You sound okay. like it though. You sound like yeah. it. Uh, no, 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 no. Because uh, 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 I can't explain it because, because uh, when we say that uh, uh, when when there's mm-hmm. a teaching say that uh, you have to love your your enemy, because uh, normally we will hate our 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 enemy, right? We will hate our Uh, you hit your kids. Enemy. You hit your friends. It doesn't mean that they're your enemies. Do you know the biblical definition of an enemy in this case? You're misapplying it. The slave is not your enemy; it's your property, and you can do with it what you want. And at least Christianity, historic Christianity, that's why Paul sends his friend slave back to him. He didn't free him; he sent it back to him because it was not his property. So if you if you read Ephesians six five, it says, "Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and sincerity of heart, just as you would show to Christ." So basically, they are making the slave masters like God obey them in every way, like you would worship Christ. 
Uh, yes, because of, uh, because the, all, you know, like, passages like this probably propel the cross Atlantic slavery, you know, the chattel slavery. They probably use uh, passages like this, yes, and they made yes, the slaves I, read these passages and they were forced to become Christians, many of them, as you know. Uh, yes, I know that, uh, I know. I know that uh, many Christians uh, in the in the, in the past they use this verse to justify to justify. It's, it's still there in the Bible. They haven't removed it. Uh, how can you? How can a slave master be uh, basically shown the same respect as one would show Christ? It doesn't make sense, does it? Love your enemy. What kind of love is this? Uh, because Paul, he was not the you no. Know, he was not a king, you know. He he was not a lawmaker. He was just a no, just a. Well, it's it's preacher. a Bible, my brother. Forget it. Whether Paul wrote it or whoever wrote it, the fact is the Bible is considered to be the word of God, and everything that's in the Bible, whether it's in the Old Testament or New Testament, is God breathed and is used for teaching and rebuking and so on. Two Timothy um, three sixteen. It says that very clearly. That doesn't every. Passage in the Bible is God breathed, so you, you can't blame Paul or somebody else. As long as it's in the Bible, it's canonized. There you go. Yes, but uh, but the because the Bible teach about love. Um, I'm sorry to, to say that I I I I uh, I still insist that because uh, it teach to love the 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 enemy. That's why uh, it actually. Okay, I got a to question. I got a question for you. Then why does Paul send the slave back to its master and not say, "Hey, stay with me," if it's about love your enemy? And he knows that the slave's life was in danger. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe the slave is the, the, the is. Uh, no, no. Okay. I don't want you to speculate. I don't want you to speculate. If see the thing is, you can't argue for Christianity if you don't know the Bible. And so if you don't know biblical beliefs, if you don't know the history of Christianity, you can't give me a defense that you make up. It's a historical fact from Paul himself. He sent the slave back to its master. Paul never abrogated slavery. The slave is not your enemy. You can't interpret it in that way. I'm sorry. The slave is your property. It's chattel. It belongs to you. You can beat it. You can spite it. You can spit on it. It doesn't matter. So, yeah, it doesn't work this way, friend. And I'll give you another passage. In 1 Peter 2.18, it says, Servants or slaves be subject to your masters with all respect, not only the good and gentle ones, but also the unjust ones. Can't have it more clear than this, my friend. I'll give you one in Titus 2.9. Bid slaves to be submissive to their masters and to give satisfaction in every respect. They are not to be refractory nor to pilfer but to show entire and true fidelity to the masters, obviously. So you tell me, if these passages in the Bible do not condone slavery, then I don't know what does. Are you a Christian, mate? Uh, no, really, I, I'm, I'm not a Christian. Sure. For real, for real. Sure, sure, 100%. One, <laughs> why not? That's fine. Right. Why not? Maybe they didn't read these passages to him. One second, one second. Why not? Why aren't you Christian? I haven't. I I have not really considered about Christian because I am still learning. I am still learning. So I know. I know about slavery in 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 Christianity. I know about the no no. You, uh, know, you don't know about, about slavery in Christianity. You ain't got a clue about <laughs> slavery in Christianity. You ain't got a clue. Yeah, he said it's only in the Old Testament, but he probably did not read these passages in the New Testament, which I quoted. I don't know why he's not from. Christian. Actually, the uh, what 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 sorry? Why are you not Christian? Why I'm not Christian because uh, I have no religion. I I was brought up in the in the uh, family that has no religion. No, I know, but you seem to be like looking at the Bible. Jesus is love. Christianity is love. Why are you not in that loving religion? Um, be because I I also have some uh I I also I also have uh. Christian friend friend around me, and then they always uh tell me that uh the Bible teach about love, and then I I also I already read the verse. You're about a Christian, the, mate. The love of I don't care what you say. You're a Christian. You're blagging. I I'm not Christian. I'm. You are. You're a Christian. Get off. 
There's no way. Are, are you going on about defending the Bible and love and this and you're not a Christian? Why won't you be a Christian? It's a lovely idea. Oh, this camera's doing my head in. What's wrong with the camera? Look, he, he, even Snoop, he's a Christian. Even Snoop, <laughs> who's a Christian himself, and he's a Christian. Pretending, coming on with his half-baked, oh, slavery, oh, right-hand possesses. Oh, please. Um, all right. Goodbye, sir. That's it. No more guests. Uh, let's see if anyone else. Oh, is no, there must be guests. They can't all be afraid of Daniel so badly. Daniel is just. Oh, they're smashing. afraid of you guys. They're afraid of Ajaz just <laughs> quoting verse after verse in the Hashem. No, no, what is Daniel's like the uh, anti icky <laughs> thing you see? So they want to come on and try <laughs> try to make us feel awkward. And we're, and Daniel's like, yeah, and what? So what? <laughs> And, and this is the reality, though. Seriously, how does even if even if you took slaves, how does that mean God doesn't exist? And how does that believe Islam is false? It, it just doesn't make no sense. The logic. Yeah. <laughs> well, we got modern slavery today, like the prisons in America, where they got like a million people incarcerated, and they're forced to do labor, hard labor, whatever labor, no pay, no nothing. It's modern slavery for you. Subhanallah. So Hamza, no one else. Is that There's it? No one in that chat. It's empty. Oh, I've never seen it empty like that. There's usually some of one of the trolls is knocking around. Share the link again. Share the link again. There must be at least one. There must be at least one guy out there. The, well, there's people hiding in the chat. Should we just bully them? Yeah. Why not? All right. Should we bully? Um, <laughs> well, I just timed yeah, Rob. I'm, I'm Rob. against cyberbullying. You, you need to get that consent first. Yeah. Oh my. God. <laughs> I just no, want to say. I'm, I just want to say, Rob, I warn you, don't mock the salam again. You do this repeatedly. You mock the salam, I oh mock my. you. You go personal, I go personal, full stop. So I will keep muting you until you apologize for misusing the salam. I'm not, I'm not here to be your friend. We're here to have a dialogue. The minute you begin mockery, I'll give it back. I'm sorry, that's just the way it works, right? So turn the other cheek, Rob. Turn it now. Let me see it again. Has anyone seen the movie Tombstone? Tombstone? Is it like a cowboy movie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where you call down the thunder and here it comes. <laughs> hey, it's Ray. <laughs> From oh, the uh... frying pot into the fire. <laughs> Sorry, who's hey, that? Because really like... uh, uh, you're the only guest. Welcome. Thank you. All right. Thanks for having me on. Uh, I'll try to be quick with this one. So I'll put them in you're the back quick. chat. The concept here... Quick. So uh, if Islam right, okay. is true, if Islam is true, then it can't teach something that isn't true universally. Are we going to go to the be... bones and the teeth again? Because that was fun. <laughs> then, it's, do y'all ever let people speak? Thank you. So I put them in the back chat. And you can read what the argument really is. But uh, once again, so if Islam is true, then it can't teach something that isn't true and Muslims would not believe that it is true and teach it is true. This is the premise that I'm coming with. So wow. in 67, uh, 67, four of the Quran, uh, Al Muk, I believe it is right. Uh, so, 67, um, four. so Allah, one second, one second, one second, one second, one second. Uh, one minute. 67 4. 67 4, you said? Yes. It's in the back oh, chat. Huh? <sighs> Bismillah. So, I don't think that's um, a one. <laughs> 67 1 through 67 1 through 4 is essentially. Uh, all right. Let, let me read it. Let line. me read it. Oh, one second. One second, Ray. Let me read it. All right. Bismillah rahman rahim. Blessed is the one in whose hands rests all authority. And he is most capable of everything. He is the one who created death and life in order to test which of you is best in deeds. And he is the almighty, all forgiving. He is the one who created the seven heavens, one above the other. You will never see any imperfection in the creation of the most compassionate. So look again. Do you see any flaws? Then look again and again. Your sight will return frustrated and weary. And indeed, we adorned the lowest heaven with stars like lamps and made them as missiles for storms. I just said 67 oh through God. 4. What? So, so through 4. Okay, so the main thing here is that Allah in his perfect speech is claiming that sight returns to the eye. 
Now, um, we can also see... Whoa, 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 stop, 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 Ray, stop, Ray, stop, Ray, stop, Ray. Let me just edit your mic setting so we can hear that in all its glory. What are you saying Allah saying? He said, look again, and your sight will return. So this is sight returning right, right. to the eye. Now, this is not how sight works. Light enters the eye. Now, if, before you start trying <laughs> so to just go kick off, off now. on the rails, before you start going off on the rails... We also have in Sunnah.com in the background. I want to hear this. Sahih Hadith, Hadith, let him finish. Sahih Hadith, when Muhammad talks about people do not raise your eyes up during Salat because your sight will not, your gaze will not return to you. Now, we also have Q Tafsir on this verse for, you know, um, uh, Kathir, right? And he even says that the, uh, I'll read it directly just so that it's not like, uh, so that I'm not misphrasing it. I know how y'all hate it when people. Wait, why are you crying that badly? Come on, Rachel. So, so thus the ayah means that if you continuously look, no matter how much you look, your sight will not re will return to you. So, this is by this verse we can take that Islam, Allah's perfect words says that sight returns to the eye. We have hadith where Muhammad says that. Your sight will not return to you if you look up at during your prayers, your salat. And then we also have Kathir explaining that uh, the meaning of this verse is that no matter how much you look up, your sight will return to you. Sorry, really? it's, a, it's an idiom. It's an idiom. It's an idiom of language. So wait, no, no, wait, no, no, in, no. The, the, wait, wait, the hadith sources? that you cited, the hadith that you cited is in Bab. Khushu'a salah. Khushu'a, it means humbleness. Salah means prayer. So that what you're, the hadith that you're citing about not lifting the gaze in prayer is about the etiquette of prayer, specifically the formal, formal ritual prayer, where it's advised that you look down. You don't look to the sky while you're praying. So this is a statement specifically of the Prophet, peace be upon him, for prayer. It's not a general statement about well, no, we can also, no time in your life look up at the sky because... I never made that claim. That's not the claim that we're making here. Then what's well, the claim? The title, and, 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 so, what is so your claim? Also, can you state your claim also, clearly? What is your, what is your the claim? claim? The claim here is that through Allah's words, Muhammad's hadith, and through the teaching of scholars all the way to Ibn Kathir, it has been taught... That sight returns to the eye, which is not how it works. That light. So which, which oh, part of Ibn Kathir are you reading? Are you reading, second, are you reading the second. tafsir of this I, particular I've got, verse? I've got, I've got the tafsir. Yeah, Ray, Yeah. Are, are you, you reading the tafsir Ibn Kathir for this verse or some some other verse? But Ray, I'm using I'm this one. I just. I'm trying to understand what do you understand when it says your sight or your vision will return to you. What What do you think that's referring to? Well, if you the whole three verses before. No, right. Just go to the Quran. No, uh, no, just go to the Quran. We are talking about the, the Quran. Quran is saying. This right here is saying? Allah telling people. No, what, what this you, is what Allah telling saying? people to look in the sky. Look in the yeah. sky. Look down. Do you see any cracks? Yeah. Look back up. And He says yeah. that your sight will return to uh, will return to you. What does so, that mean? Which means what? What does that mean? What does that mean? It's also you? in fourteen forty three of the Quran. No, no, what where it no, no, what does it mean? Look, what it means that Allah is from making that a claim. Passage Allah you just read. What does it mean? What does Allah it mean? is making a claim that What's sight the claim? returns to the eye. Yeah, what, what does, does that, that mean? mean according to you? What does it mean? It's wait. Do y'all not understand this? No, no, I, I want to know you understand it because you're just reading it verbatim without explaining to us what so do you understand from it. So, so earlier Daniel even said that they have to know what the scholars of Islam talk about. So that's the reason we talk about, I even give what the um, uh, the uh, Q-Tafsir talks about. So in it, it even mentions that thus the ayah means that your sight will return to you. So it what doesn't does even mean? matter. Wait, wait what a does second. What that mean? It means that well, the sight returns right. to I'm the eye. I'm going to give you one last chance. What are you right. It means second, the sight returns to the eye. Right, I'm going to kick you off for a second. You know, we're going to ask you a very simple question. What do you think is being said in that verse? What does that mean, the sight returning? He's just repeating himself. That's I don't what he's doing. I don't know. I want to know what you think it means. And I, I yeah. do you think it's like, I don't know, explaining some scientific method of sight? Is that what you think it's saying? Tell us what you think it's saying. Last chance. 
It is saying that sight returns to the eye. After it leaves mean? the eye. That when you look at something, the sight leaves the eye and then returns to the eye. And that is how you see. And oh, this is MG. what... You say OMG, okay. but you haven't. Nobody has refuted the. Text you know, you the you you, you the said text. that you have read Ibn Kathir. I've got Ibn Kathir in front of me, and that is not what it says. Shall I read to you what it says? Actually, yes. So, in Ibn Kathir, uh, he quotes uh, Ibn Abbas line. So Ibn Abbas said that this means it will be exhausted. That means you look. Doesn't matter how many times you look. Yes, your sight will return to you exhausted and humbled. Because Allah, in Allah's creation, there is no flaw, yes? And there is no deficiency in that. And this is what Ibn Kathir says. And so he goes on to I, say, no, no, wait, wait, he I goes on to quote that. Mujahid and Qatada and as suddi all said that it means broken down fatigue that comes from weakness. Thus the ayah means that if you continuously looked, no matter how much you look, your sight will return to you. Yes. Exactly what I said. So how did I miss? How, wait, 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 wait a minute, I, wait a minute. But then they wrong. tell you what it means. It says <laughs> it says that it will return to you due to the inability to see any flaw or defect in Allah's creation. Yes, that, yes but that's not, and worn out, no, meaning exa no, what, meaning exhausted and broken down, feebleness due to the great amount of repeated looking without being able to detect any deficiency. Okay, so we have Ibn Kathir telling clearly what it means, which is against what you said and your That's understanding. That's not against what I said. It directly what you said. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Okay, so, anyway, goodbye, my friend. If that's all. Yeah, Ray, just, I know he's probably listening somewhere. Uh, and yeah. just to repeat what Hashim it's said. It's a waste of time, you... honestly. We asked him so many times what it means. He keeps repeating. Returns yeah. to you, returns to you. But what does that mean to you? He never so, answered that question. I mean, know that. But you know, it demonstrates, though. This is the arguments they've got against Islam. But he can't this is, read. This is, this is what we're reduced to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But he can't, like, I think Ajaz is right. He can't read because Ibn Abbas said, and he's quoting this verse, this part of the verse, your sight will return to you, khasi, meaning, you know, uh, again. So Ibn Abbas said that khasi means humiliated. Mujahid and Qatada both said it means despised. Yeah, so go. it doesn't mean your, you know, the image goes out and then the image goes back into your head. Some weird despised and worn there. out. Yeah, it yeah, says exactly. despised and worn out. Yeah. Uh, so it's right, just saying that you're trying to ex mosque. I'm pretty sure this is a Muslim ex Muslim. I think could be an ex mosque. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, mate. You're muted. Ex mosque. You need to You're unmute muted. the mic so we can hear you. Ex mosque. To so be honest, this is the smartest ex Muslim I've ever heard. So articulate. Oh, honestly. Silence this is golden. No intellectual <laughs> justification for leading Islam, to be honest. Stay silent if you agree that Islam is the truth. Subhanallah. Done. Welcome back. Another shot. Silence is consent after all. Silence is consent. Yeah, probably the virgin as well, isn't he? Come on. Why am I laughing? Why am I laughing? I'm not unmarried. So this is. Don't be shy. All right, next. Daniel won't bite. There is no next. This is it. This is all. There's no next. Let's say that Dua and finish. Let's get rid of him. All right. We need to do some proper hunting for guests for the arena because this this is ridiculous. Rays and robs and <laughs> antinatalist was even here. <laughs> God yeah, it's all you got only steel. What do you say? Have, have you heard of antinatalist, Daniel? <laughs> we need Sorry. fresh ones. Uh, which atheist? His name is antinatalist. No, wait, who is he? So he believes people shouldn't have children. Oh, okay. antinatalism. It's like a philosophy. Yeah, yeah. Because of suffering, so because a kid might suffer, don't have it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. This is just, this is projection. Yeah. He'll probably change his mind once he reaches eight years old, as there's no one to look after him. Yeah, no one's bringing his favorite. To sweet. be honest, he's probably an end <laughs> seller at this point, and you know, antinatalism is his justification for being no, well, an well, well, If you can't have babies, why not just kill yourself as well? Because that's what I said. 
That's what I said. That's my first question. Why are you just kill yourself then, mate? Exactly. Well, then I mean, you won't yeah. be a threat to the anti-natalist movement. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, God. All right. Um, we can wrap up then, yeah. I did interesting characters here coming on this. Oh. <laughs> No, we need to do some proper hunting, get some proper guests, man. The problem is the caliber of the get the, the gladiators we have. Um, people are afraid to come on, man, because it's going to get exposed, and their little warm fuzzy beliefs get mashed up. Um, Sufian oh, says, "Thank you for joining, Daniel. I enjoy your content. Keep up the great work, guys." Alhamdulillah. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, we got Mohammed El Goof. Yeah, yeah bring him on. Goof. Yeah, bring him on. Yeah, he's a goof. Let's bring him on. Oh, like a oh, Al Ghul. You misread the name, Hamza. Al Ghul. Oh. Al Ghul. So, yeah, sorry, guys. Um, uh, I just have a question. Like, uh, Are you Muslim? A... Yeah, I'm, of course. I'm a Muslim. I just, uh, I just have Where's a Where's the salam, brother? Where's the salam? Yeah, yeah I was going to I was gonna say assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yeah. I just, uh, you know, I have a friend. He's uh, like uh, non-Muslim. Yeah. He asked me like a question. Like, uh, and uh, I've been like... Uh, I didn't know how to answer this question. So I was like, uh, I wanted to ask you guys like how to reply to this question, which wa which is the question is like, you know, uh, uh, how do you know, how do we know that uh, rak'at, you know, the number of rak'ats is uh, like uh, for Fajr, I mean, for Subh is two, for Dhuhr is four. Yeah, I didn't know how to answer this. So Because that's Muta Watson. Listen, listen, we uh, have the description to reply. Of we have the description of the prophetic A non-Muslim asked you that question. Universal. Sorry, sorry, one second, Judge, before you yeah. respond. A non-Muslim asked you that question. Yeah, he's like, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, Nukarani, you know, like... Uh, oh, God. He, 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 yeah, he disbelieves so he, in... So he's a Qurani he's, asking yeah. you how you know how many rakats. Yeah, he's, he's asking this, yeah. Well, surely shouldn't you be asking him? <laughs> No, no, I asked him. I asked him. I, I, I mean, I mean, I had a conversation with him literally like uh, I, I tried to explain. But uh, what is like the best answer? How to deal with these guys? I mean, that's that's that, that's like uh, what Muhammad, I want to does, know. Does he does he do, does he perform Siam in Ramadan? Yeah, I asked him, how do you know this stuff? I mean, you perform. Uh, I mean, how do you know when when to fast? How to know what? I mean, Ahkam Siam. How, yeah, I asked him. Does he, but, does he know, though? Does he? Does he do? No, I mean, I, I, does, I, I, does he fast during Ramadan? I, I don't think so. I don't think so. But you know, does he not believe he ask, that? Yeah, he keep asking me. Yeah. Siyam, when he says kutiba yeah. alaykum as siyam, does he not believe there's an order to do siyam? Yeah, he, he keep asking me and harassing me, and you know, I just want to like uh, know how to deal with these guys. I mean, Muhammad, in general, stop no, no, the reason Muhammad. So yeah, that's that's a good point. Muhammad, the reason why I'm asking you these questions is because mm -hmm. the, the different rejectors of the Sunnah, yeah, the Quran only is, they all have different positions. So you have to you have to that understand the which real position. One. Yeah, you have to understand. Yeah, you have to understand who which sure. one is that is real or is that just a fake account? Not real. He's put out apologetics wrong, so it's not the real one. Not and plus, yeah. plus David, what can't kind of debate Daniel? He, the guy wears a dress, Daniel will just humiliate him. Come on now, <laughs> cross dressing pervert. So, so yeah, so Muhammad, you have to you have to identify what type of rejector of the Sunnah he is because you have some who don't even believe the idea of Siam as fasting exists, they have a different definition of the word Siam, they'll have a different definition of the word Salah and Zakat, etc. Yeah. So if mm -hmm. he believes that there is something called Siam that is an obligation, which is part of the Ahkam of the Sharia, which is performed in the Ramadan, then I normally ask them, when was Ramadan? When is Ramadan? What month does it come after? Yeah, mm -hmm. Because you yeah. need to know what, which, what month, what year or what part of the year is Ramadan. And that's not contained within the Quran. You know, we know Ramadan comes after Shawwal, so Sha'ban. So we know it comes after Sha'ban, but how do we know it comes after Sha'ban? Because this is something outside of the Qur'an. So if he accepts that Siyam is an obligation within the month of Ramadan, then for him to know when Ramadan is, he needs to go outside of the Qur'an in order to establish that 
Ramadan comes after Sha'ban. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Similarly, there's uh, the prohibition of uh, fighting in the sacred months. So which are the sacred months? Because it's not mentioned again within the Quran. So there's a hukum here that's established within the Quran, and there's no uh, any specific uh, uh, details about what those sacred months are within the Quran itself. Yeah. So there's many mm-hmm. examples that you can give. Just make it as basic as possible when you speak to these yeah. people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah you know regarding this uh, my, my question you know you know what I answered uh, what what was my answer you know I I, I told him like this you know and uh, I mean in our, in our religion Islam we have uh, in Sunnah we have uh, Sunnah Fi'liya and Sunnah Qawliya uh, I, I I told him that in uh, there is a hadith which is which says that Sallu like pray like how you saw me praying pray yeah. and i told him like i told him like uh muslims i mean sahaba ridwan allah alayhim well, uh, they were with the prophet like uh with him like in his uh daily life they saw him praying they saw him fasting they saw him doing all the ahkams and after that these sahaba Give us the Sunnah, give us uh, everything, give us the, the even the Quran. Uh, we were, uh, I mean, Tawatur, Tawatur from the time of the, I mean, Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him. I think that's the answer, if, if, if I'm not mistaken. Muhammad, that is the answer. I'm not saying that what you're saying is wrong. The problem mm-hmm. is these people, they can't comprehend your answer. Yeah, you have to make it very, very basic. To the point where you say, when is Ramadan in, in the year? What month does it come after? Because that's mm-hmm. how basic you have to get it to these people, to get it through their heads, to say, actually, yeah, I don't know when Ramadan is, and yet I'm meant to fast during Ramadan. So I need to know that there's a Sha'ban, a month called Sha'ban, and after Sha'ban is Ramadan. How do I know that? Well, now I'm going outside of the Quran, and I'm going to the Sunnah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, yes, yes, I would yes. not be able to fulfill this. So everything you said was absolutely spot on, correct, yeah. But they are so you know, misguided in this topic area that they won't even appreciate your answer. That's why you have to be. Mm-hmm. There's also a, a good. Uh, there's a good work done by uh, Mufti Taqi Usmani uh, on the uh, proof and the evidences of the Sunnah, and he gives evidences within the Quran of this what we call the uh, i think it's called the unwritten revelation where in the quran it affirms implicitly yeah the fact that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was receiving revelation like for example in surah al-baqarah where it talks about the change of qibla yeah so the fact that there was a change of qibla back to mecca implies there was a, a qibla before that now what was the qibla before it's not mentioned in the quran so they mm-hmm. were praying Salah in a direction that they were ordered to pray, and then they had to change it. So what was that first order Petra. That mentioned in the Quran? What's that, sorry? Mm-hmm. I was going to say Petra to bring up the Dan. Petra. So far. <laughs> yeah, 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 obviously, yeah. Mm-hmm. this. Yeah, so <laughs> but I'm just saying that there's many examples like this. In Surah Sur- Al-Tahreem, it talks about mm-hmm. how the Prophet ﷺ was informed about what the wives of the Prophet ﷺ had said to each other, yeah. So these are examples of wahi given to the Prophet Sallam, yeah, which is mentioned in the Quran, yeah, uh, which is not found in the Quran itself, yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's like mm-hmm. I say, it's very oh, basic. Yeah. It's a good book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Th- thank could, you for this recommendation. Could, yeah. Could I append to this just a little bit? Yeah. Of all the madhahib, how many of them pray three rakat for Fajr forward? None of them, right? You only yeah. pray two rakah for fad, right? good. If they were making it up and they were guessing, why didn't some pray three, some pray four, some pray five? It is universally two, which tells us that there's an authority, there's a cultural practice embedded within the people, transmitted generation by generation. Otherwise, you don't end up at two universally. There will be one school of fiqh that says no rakah for fajr, another that says three, another that says four. If they were making it up as they went along, they can do something like that. But we don't see that. Therefore, we must assume on this that universally all Muslims do it this way. Kind of like, if I may ask you a question, brother, how do you use a fork? Do you hold it by the end with the spiky bit or the end with the handle? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I see. Right? Of, of, no of one course. holds it. No one yeah. holds it the opposite way, right? But if mm-hmm. someone did hold it the opposite way, that would be evidence that not everyone was taught the same thing, right? Same yeah, thing yeah. applies to the for yeah. all the mm-hmm. salah. It's a wet example, but I hope it works, inshallah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you, guys, for your work. Um, I mean, I'm a big fan. I try to watch you guys to know how to answer, you know, to these uh, guys, and uh, I'm, you know, really appreciate. I'm like uh, I really appreciate the work and i'm much obliged thank you for this uh, for this uh, chance uh, sorry for uh, i mean taking your time okay thank you guys assalamu alaikum bro uh we'll have a few muslims on just to quickly say hello assalamu alaikum bro oh alaikum how are you brothers it's been a while man yes, Alhamdulillah, yes. um so you know i have a question because in one of your the, audio is very yeah. low brother ahmed we can barely just, hear you it's just better now yeah much better okay yeah so in one of your meetings with the the guy why so religious it was like maybe a couple of months ago shabir was on and why so religious was arguing with you about mathematics and the subjective versus objective i don't know if hamza if you remember this shabir was uh, asking him oh, i'm sorry go on Taki shabir was money on the authority of the Sunnah. So Shabir Go ahead, brother. Me, Sorry. Oh, no problem. What I wanted to ask is, Shabir was trying to corner him into the concept of mathematics being either objective or subjective or abstract. Uh, anyway, Ray, you went off the rails and you guys kicked him off. But what, is this a, a tool in, in uh, da'wah that maybe like the idea was that since mathematics is objective, that, it, that objective truth exists? I don't know what was the topic or where were you guys going to go with that? If my question is confusing, I understand. Um, just remember a stream from how long ago? <laughs> what? Well, with a what question, was, Ray what's your, Ahmed, what's your specific question related to that? It might be easy for us to be able to answer. I don't have a question per se. I was thinking, do you guys have like a technique to argue with atheists that since mathematics is... I'm assuming that the conversation was going in the direction that since mathematics is objective, then you believe in objective truth. Is that what the topic was? And this, uh, yeah, so the, the, the stream I'm talking about Hamza was like a month ago. I, mean, I know it's been a while. Um, Shabir was on and Ray was going off the rails and you guys argued with him. And there was this, the, the Muslim metaphysician was on it too. And Ray was talking about how mathematics is abstract and he was trying to play with like use it as a tool against you. It's still so are you asking if mathematics is, is an example of objective truth? Is that what you're asking? Yes, and can you use that in that one? The same yeah, why not? So okay. let me give you let me give you an, uh, an argument. This is an argument from uh, a philosopher called James Anderson. What he basically says, he says propositions exist, yeah, and propositions are truth bearers, yeah. Now, what does it mean by truth bearer? So, for example, if I say uh, two is bigger than one, yeah, I could say that in English, I could say in Arabic, I could say in French, I could say in Spanish. So, it's not the language, it's not the the particular language that I'm using that conveys, uh, you know, that defines its meaning. It's the proposition behind the various uh, languages that I'm using. So the proposition is called the truth bearer, yeah? Now the truth bearer itself, is it something that's material or immaterial? And we would say the truth bearer would be immaterial. So it's something that exists uh, uh, as a, you know, it has a content, it's a proposition that has a content, and that content uh, has some sort of mental content, so it has information within it, yeah? And so... This is an argument, what they call a transcendental argument for the existence of God, because they're saying if propositions exist, like, for example, mathematical propositions, and then necessary propositions, meaning they have to be true, yeah, objectively in all possible worlds or all possible universes, yeah, then those transcendent, those, those uh, immaterial propositions, those true pair of propositions, they need to be grounded. And it, the best way to understand how they're grounded are these, these propositions that contain mental content is in grounding it in the nature of God or in the mind of God, if you want to use that word. Basically, God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
gives that uh, gives these groundings to these necessary propositions and truths. Maybe that's the argument because I know Jake uses that argument a lot, the Muslim metaphysician. So maybe that was the discussion that was being had. Sorry if I've gone into tap <laughs> mode. <laughs> you you made it more confusing. <laughs> so I'm completely. No, I'm understand. So yeah, but it's, it can be used as a as an objective truth, isn't it? Yeah, so you want to say that there are true things, aren't there, in the world, which are yeah. definitely true, yeah? That no, if I mean, I mathematics, live, if I live, Yeah, so if I live on Mars, or if I live on Earth, or if I live in a different universe, it's going to be true. Yeah, yeah. wherever you go, it's going to be, 2 yeah. plus 2 is going to be 4. Well, well not, unless you, not unless you live in Rob's communist hellhole, right? Don't, don't forget <laughs> that. So, brothers, so, how do you make leap? So, let's say, so let's say we agree that one plus one is one multiplication with multiple cultures. You're breaking up, bro. You're breaking up. Bro, well, he's in a restaurant as usual, so it's the restaurant's yes, Wi Fi. Yes. Re restaurant Wi Fi. You've got to put on your data, bro. Your 5G. Don't use the <laughs> restaurant's Wi Fi. That's a lot of time. I'll keep to my touch. Sound like a bro. Okay, sound like a Yeah, mate. True propositions, true spares. Well, you sound depressed, bro. Are you okay? What? <laughs> well, I hear uh, you're a big fan you. of Brother Daniel. Wa alaikum as -salam. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, very big fan of Daniel. Uh, I just wanted to thank Dan Brother Daniel for all the work he has done and uh, especially for taking on the Murtads in debates. Mm. These debates, um, uh, they're just they, these debates are very mm, they've boosted my iman a lot. Mm, and uh, I'm gonna okay, I'm very nervous. Uh, 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 I just wanted to say one thing that uh, Daniel, uh, I think you should do this a lot more as uh, teenagers like me are very prone to these. To the dangers that these orthods propagate. So how the more you do, how old are you? Uh, I'm I'm 17. I, I'll be 17. Oh Hamza, you know what we gotta do? Adnan, thank you for joining us, brother. Daniel loves you, and somewhere in return, Salam alaikum. <laughs> yeah, I love bless you and Jazakallah khair. Um, alhamdulillah, I'm glad that these debates are helpful. Oh, you that serious hair, hey, Yilmaz. What's going on? Wow. Hello. Hello. Can you guys hear me? Yep. You can. Yeah, okay. I, I got a question. It Why are you really read? My mind. It's about our dean and like sometimes I think there are things that are really khurafi in our religion. Like the other day, I was watching a program, uh, me and my wife, we want to go to Medina. And uh, this, we were searching to see what like people are doing, how they are doing it. And I was explaining to him, can you guys still hear me? Can you turn your mic up, mate? Hello? Can you turn your mic up? Can I hear you? Not turn your mic off, turn it up. <laughs> I definitely can't hear you now. You get Talk more way. loudly. Talk more loudly. You need to loud. speak, speak up. Speak Some up. authority in your voice. Oh, okay, he, he drinks a lot of soy, I can tell. <laughs> Wait a second. There is no mic volume, mic thing here. No problem. Gilmar, just uh, ask your question. Sorry. Yeah. Um, you hear him? I can hear him. Can yeah, you, I can hear yeah. him. So this guy was explaining that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was born in sajda, raising his finger, saying "Ummati, Ummati." It doesn't go in my, you know. It's very khurafi. It's, it's not. I don't know how to explain. Well, stop watching those. Per just stop watching <laughs> the program. <laughs> the solution done. <laughs> yeah, I've never heard. Switch channel. Like switch. Switch to a different channel. 
Yeah, I, 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 no. I've never heard any narration like that. And in, when he was born, like the room was full of light and stuff like that. I, like the other time he was saying, there was a battle. Here is the grave of the battle man. And like Prophet Muhammad was having a battle over this mountain. And uh, when they won the battle, they thought they won this battle. Some people run down, some of his uh, Sahaba run down for taking the like the Ghanima of the battle. And the horse horsemen came over this mountain and killed most of his Sahaba and stuff like that. These are a bit, I, these are a bit. That's awful. Yemaz, going, that's Yemaz, battle of Yemaz. Yemaz. That's that's battle battle. Have, have you been to Have you been to uh, Medina? You can go it there. It sounds like Ron Bar Simpson telling the history of Springfield to Bart. <laughs> <laughs> battle of Oman. But you go there. You go there. The way. The way. You... <laughs> Sorry. It, it, look, when you go to Medina, you can see Battle of Oman. Where Battle of Oman took place. You can see how it was uh, the opportunity of the horses, how they could go around the cavalry. They're not going over some Mount Everest. Yeah, it's not like Mount Everest. I'm, ju I'm just That's curious. Right. How did he find, how, how did he go from being a baby, being in Sajda and saying the Shahada, jumped on horses and battle being impossible? That was like a big escalation. I'm he didn't jump over Mount Everest, no. It just went around no, no, no. this he, hill. 12,000 horses came up of this mountain, kill, killed most Yilmaz. of his Sahab. It wasn't 12,000 horses. Yilmaz, 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 Yilmaz. And, and the mountain Yilmaz. was too small. Concentrate. Yilmaz. Okay, All right. Stop watching that channel. Just, just turn it off. <laughs> All right. As my brother said, when you go to Medina and you stand near Uhud, there's, there's, there's okay. a place where the armies were positioned, okay? And when you look, okay. you, you can come around the back of it. Yeah? It was, it was a way to come to the rear of the Muslim army. So the Prophet Sallallahu put archers on the mountain to stop Khalib and Walid coming around. Right? Okay, yes. yes. What happened when, uh, when they killed Hamza um, and the Muslims charged the, uh, the Quraysh, the archers mm -hmm. on the mountain left their position to join, to try to get the booty because they thought the battle was won. And what happened okay. then, Khalib and Walid had clear... Uh, route now to come around behind the Muslims, and it was a pincer movement then, yeah. And, and the whole point was to, one second, Yamas. The whole point was to keep when you're given an order to keep it. There's a reason why the Prophet put the archers there, yeah. So this yeah. is what we believe as Muslims, yeah. That when you're given, when you're told to do a task, stick to that task, yeah. Yes, they didn't fly. Like this, that doesn't go to my Sahabas not listening to Prophet Muhammad. So right. No, no, no. They no. thought the battle was won. But that happened. What are you? Some, some Sahaba, no, not I, all. I believe in the some Subhanahu small Ta'ala. number. I, I they were human. Why, why do you not believe? They were human. They were not some angels. They thought the battle who was wouldn't won. disobey. The booty and was besides, they, they were not like literally disobeying. They thought they won the battle and they can take the Ganima. And remember, the, the Quraysh came to that battle with everything. Their women, their, their possessions, everything. This was a massive army against the Muslims at Uhud. And so they thought that we'd won the battle, that the booty was there to be taken. And when the archers left their position, this then left the Muslims all exposed. And Khalid bin Walid came behind and did what he did. I think he's, I think he's shocked that the... Sahabas would disobey the Prophet. I think that's his main so, so question. Human human nature, mate. No one's exactly perfect. Right. No, he was he was shocked about the horses going over the mountain. Exactly. Uh, like no, I think he's got over that. The mountain is <laughs> a small mountain, right? It's on it's not a big mountain, right? Why yeah, is it located on the mountain? Not a massive it's mountain, yeah. And, There's and Google you know, Maps. Just, just go to Google Maps. Maps. Google when maps. you are above a mountain, you can see horses at the other side of the mountain. I didn't see. I will go, inshallah, this Ramadan, inshallah, if inshallah. Allah invites. Inshallah. Oh, inshallah. Yeah. Look, Yelmaz, the main thing. That above the mountain, you have two of yeah. everywhere, you know, like you cannot yeah. miss 12,000 horses. They, no, it was Yilmaz, not 12,000. There, was, there wasn't 12,000 horses. 
I think I think how I don't know how many people are owed. I think there's three thousand uh Quraysh, isn't it? Three thousand or so. That's how many warriors yeah, the Quraysh had. Three, yeah. Three thousand a lot of horses to miss. No, not three thousand horses. Nobody missed the horses. Uh, why do Nobody I feel that he's putting horses. our legs? <laughs> this guy. Are you, are you joking with us? I think no, I'm not, joking. I'm not joking. I'm just, I'm just. Some, some things are not Nobody, going in my brain. No, okay. Just go read. Just go read about the battles of the prophet. Yeah, there are books on this. They'll teach you exactly. What, you can't read about can't, the Magazi. Yeah, we, we can't discuss this if you if you haven't read about it from an authentic source, yeah. right? And and and, and very uh, very thin question. In my question is that are these shaitan playing around with my brain or is it normal? Is no, I just uh, telling you go read a book on it, inshallah. You must. Assalamualaikum. <laughs> Bye. Where, where are you from? Which country? Turkey. I'm in UK, uh, in London. Are you Turkish? Uh, my dad is Turkish. My mom is. Teşekkür ederim for your question. Assalamualaikum. Çok teşekkür ederim. That's my Turkish. Thank you. <laughs> this is this was a trip, Hamza. Did you like? Did you like go to like the weirdest corner of the internet and invite whoever you found? Oh, wow. Oh, Assalamualaikum alaikum wa rahmatullahi Hold on, before we proceed, is there a reason you got that 88 in your name? Uh, no, it's my little brother who did that. Okay, because there's another meaning of that. I just wanted to confirm. Please proceed. Okay. Yes, uh, I was wondering, Daniel, about Alasna. Your course about logical, I don't remember the name, it was very beneficial. I was wondering about the second. Uh, uh, Let's call it for it. The second uh, course on yeah. that series? Yeah. yeah, inshallah. I've just been so overwhelmed with a lot of different projects. I have a whole backlog of courses that I need to put out. So that's one of them. It's going to be a series. So the second part is going to be on logical fallacies. Um, okay. So the whole point of the logic courses at Alasna, oh, just to keep it very brief, is to give these kinds of logic courses that you usually would have to go to a secular source for, like college or community college or whatever, but we want to have something that's good for Muslims who want to learn uh, basic logical reasoning, critical reasoning, but without having to go to non-Muslims who will put all kinds of other ideas uh, into people's mind, cause doubts, cause shubuhat. So mm -hmm. it's going to be an extended series. Um, but yeah, please be patient with me and I'll, I'm going to put those out, inshallah. Inshallah. Um... Inshallah. And uh, the email service at Alasna. I remember I sent emails to Alasna, but um, I don't think I got to respond. Is there a reason for that? Or oh, uh, I'll talk to the person who works our support. <laughs> 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 That's fine. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Mel Rivardi, I'm a huge fan. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> oh, wait, that was Ex nihilist. What is he? Is he Muslim now? Yeah. SSG. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Wa alaikum as The lions and tigers of Islam, mashallah. Nice to see uh, all of your brothers. Uh, mm -hmm. I would, um, so my, uh, I am from New Zealand, uh, but basically from Pakistan, but I live in New Zealand. Uh, I, want, I wanted to share um, my observation that in Muslims, there are different categories of people. Uh, obviously, um, uh, they're Quranists who say that, you know, who don't believe in Hadith and Sunnah uh, altogether. But there are people that, you know, who limit Sunnah uh, and they are not willing to accept Sunnah, uh, the complete Sunnah as a source of Deen. So I, I would like you guys to, uh, you know, if you would like to comment on, you know, the sources of Deen. So when it comes to the sources of Deen, obviously Quran is the source of Deen, but Sunnah, you know, is the complete Sunnah the source of Deen, or is because there are people who limit uh, Sunnah? Uh, you know, they they say that only these Sunnah, like uh, you know, they modify the meaning of Tawatur, uh, which is uh, you know, they say that only the actions uh, are the Sunnah, but they completely you know exclude the Hadith uh, uh, from Sunnah. They don't consider the Hadith, the text, uh, as Sunnah. So I would like to you know share your uh, if you would like to. Brother, why don't you ask a sheikh these questions? Uh, my sheikhs are you. Uh, I. We're, no, we're, we're no, not no. We're not sheikhs. <laughs> That's scary. We're not sheikhs, bro. 
got an authentic teacher with ijaz and specialization in fiqh and asked the question brother is better for you Honestly, we're kind ijaz, to, you, you can have answer, ijaz haven't you it's in you my name after all. It's in my name, right? So, yeah, but brother, we are appreciate you the about, question. Yeah. But, yeah, I was but gonna we ask, can't are you, are you referring to Javed Ghamidi? Oh, God. Exactly. Quite popular. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, please. so yeah. obviously what they try to do, is, or what he tries to do, is just basically talk about Tawatir Amali uh, and Tawatir and uh, anything that's not Tawatir or to water Amali, they don't accept. But generally, obviously, the sun, isn't it, is subdivided in uh, actions, speech, and consent, what the poets have consented to, and they're subdivided into two major categories, Motuwatar and Ahad. And we take both of them, isn't it? Uh, obviously, they have different epistemic levels, and then the Ahad narrations are further subdivided into Gharib, Aziz, and Mushur, yeah? Uh, exactly. And, you know, so you have a different, uh, yeah, there's a very detailed ulum al-hadith, science of hadith, and also in addition to that is detailed aspects with regards to usul al-fiqh as well, yeah, so, uh, but like, I think like the brothers are saying, that these detailed points uh, maybe uh, need to be addressed through scholars who have studied these particular ulum in depth, uh, as well as uh, usul as well, but, um yeah, yeah, I think I obviously, you, just as a basic point though, when somebody says something so radically different that doesn't have precedence in 1400 years of Islamic scholarship, you know there's something wrong there. Yeah. And you know there's something wrong when a lot of what's being said seems to conform with a liberal secular outlook as well. Yeah. And so then you, you, you have to question whether it's a case of them trying to justify a pre, you know, preconception by changing and modifying how they view Islam to fit those preconceptions, yeah, or are they just generally, mis you know, misunderstand a particular topic or issue at hand, yeah. Um, but yeah, so, yeah, that's just a general point in terms of Sunnah, yeah. So I just uh, wanted to, you know, make, uh, make a general comment. Uh, so... Um, so there are people who say that you know because the time is progressing uh, and we in, we are into a age of uh, you know modernity and you know uh, technology now we have more information uh, software support and application supports and we can reanalyze things and you know come up with you know uh, maybe they have missed something and we have realized uh, it now in this age uh, my opinion is that that is not correct because for us for muslims the peak of uh, morality lies in the past so that's the peak of morality it's not like uh, it's not like sciences uh, where with the passage of time if there are new discoveries and you find something new so people uh, you know sometimes conflate these two things islam is not like sciences it's not like you know when uh, when you're progressing in time you will find you will have some new discoveries which they didn't find so that's where we have people like uh, on the youtube uh, uh, who say that, you know, even Umar will fail the Akidah test. So things like these uh, come up from those kind of confusions. So so that, uh, that's, uh, you know, uh, something I would like to uh, say. But uh, uh, Jazakallah Khairan, yeah, uh, I will right, definitely take the shit. Thank you. April, okay. April, you was in the back chat. What happened to you? You just disappeared. Oh. April, remember April? Oh. Was you know that? Uh, with whether Shabir had a heart attack. <laughs> April, come on. You look so confident. Where did you go? Hey, Jazz, you're muted. We can't hear you. There's a guy oh, called the Trinitarian Quran. Daniel, man, the Daniel Hakikachu supporters club is in the house. Mashallah. <laughs> April, are you still about or you run? You is it ready? April Cox, Sam? So April Cox. Yeah. Uh, uh. Daniel will love that person. Honestly, it's made for made for Daniel. Daniel, did you like did you like your interaction with Rob? He's a very brilliant scholar of nonsense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I was really blown away by his amazing logic. You know, one thing I just want to raise something. Uh, what Dan, mm -hmm. brother Daniel did actually, which was really good, is obviously Rob wanted to try to sort of say, okay, here's a verse which contradicts another verse. Yeah. And this verse, I agree 100%. I la ikraha fiddin. Yeah, there's no compulsion in religion. 
rather than just simply following him down his own little rabbit hole that he wants to go down, what Brother Daniel, and this is maybe for the audience to be aware of, is that he asked him the question, well, hold on, why should I accept? Why should we accept this idea that anybody can do whatever they want? Yeah, that there is no compulsion, that we live in this purely, an, uh, you know, uh, anarchy, yeah, where there is no government and we can just do whatever we want. And so it got, and that's when he started, I think, you know, I've seen Rob one or two, uh, two times, but that's when he started to think, oh, hold on, I'm on the back foot. So rather than we having to try to explain every particular verse of Quran and, you know, his misconceptions and things like that, to get these people to go on the back foot, to look at their own presuppositions uh, and question that. So, Jazakallah khair, Brother Daniel. Well, yeah. I think I'm, okay, I'm going to bring this guy in because he, he's got his camera on and he's walking all over his house. He looks impatient. Okay. Halal al Arazawi. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. How are you guys? Doing? What do you want? Me? Nothing. No, I was just uh, trying to observe what's going on here. It's all. Oh. You can watch it on YouTube, did you know? <laughs> <laughs> You're part of the show, mate. Come on, we're waiting to be entertained. Just kind of... <laughs> Entertain well, us. Do something. You, mate. The floor is yours. <laughs> okay, you just okay, came to say salam, that's it? Um, no, I've, I've been observing the way you've been conducting your da'wah and uh, was just interested on uh, trying to improve myself. So if there's any different... Because I've been watching, you know, the speakers, corners, guys. I've been watching Daniel. I've been watching, you know, all of the debates going on these days. But I've, I've just want to, to, to get some sort of fundamental teaching on <clears throat> how to improve on the world. It depends on your audience and where you typically do it. It, it, it. There's no one solution to all Dawa except gain knowledge and practice it, basically. Yeah, I agree with you, Jos. You've got to obviously gain the knowledge, but also at the same time, you've got to engage with people. Uh, I would say in terms of Dawa, there's two aspects to doing Dawa. One is like your quote-unquote debates type of thing. And really debates is probably not the best way to try to convince a person of Islam because you're there to try to demonstrate the strength of your idea and the weakness of his. Rather, there's another aspect, which is trying to build relationships with that person as a way to understand what his internal motivations are, why he holds the views that he holds, and then try to deconstruct those views so that he becomes aware uh, of his own mistakes or his own assumptions. The other thing that I think also needs to be understood is never accept anybody's claims, meaning that a lot of people try to smuggle in hidden premises or hidden assumptions within the conversation. Like I said about uh, what Rob was doing earlier when Daniel said, well, hold on, you live in a society that compels you. What about all states? That's the, the, you've got to try to be aware that this is what they try to do. So a lot, some people, they try to pass hidden assumptions or what's received opinion, what's considered the, you know, um, the most accepted idea and therefore everybody simply accepts it rather than actually challenging these ideas and you need to make sure these people that the, the, the hidden assumptions or the, the presuppositions that they're fundamentally challenged so that it makes them think uh, and change their views but yeah one thing also sorry, okay. that, Go. <laughs> oh sorry okay. one, one thing also with dawa there's actually an interesting sales principle for anyone who's in sales um in the business world it's called abc always be closing so <laughs> you want to always be closing in dawah in the sense that at the end of the day dawah just means to call to islam and so if you do like a lot of discussion and debate but at the end of the day you don't say you know do you want to be muslim i invite you to come into islam then you haven't really done dawah. You might have done debate. You might have done tabligh, maybe. Tabligh meaning to advertise or to promote. But we always, and this is something I have to remind myself all the time as well, that am I really inviting? Like Because some people just need to be invited. They need someone to say, be a Muslim. And sometimes we might forget that we don't actually do the closing part, which is the most important part of reaching out and extending our hands, come into Islam. Because some, some people don't need an abstract argument or 
you know, all of this knowledge, they just need, they like have a social need for connection with people. And, and when you do that, hearts can be connected. So people who are sincere there, and if you're sincere, then your hearts will connect and you can pull them into Islam just by asking. So do you want to be a Muslim? So that's my tip. Okay. I, my, I have advice, just, my advice uh, would be, no. first thing, know why you're a Muslim. Second thing, understand the presuppositions of Christianity and atheism because they're the main people you're going to be dialoguing with. And just take them out of the knees. Um, I've, I've, just noticed, uh, I've just noticed, usually, you know what happens? Um, I focus on the areas where I, I find that some maybe weakness in, in terms of knowledge. And recently, throughout, I would say, the past couple of years, it seems to be... Um, the attacks are coming from uh, the concept of the different qira'as and I don't find proper education amongst the Muslim da'is. Uh, they need, I would say, to focus on this. And I've been trying to focus on this, trying to understand the different qira'as from a historical perspective, how it developed, the transmission process, and to educate myself, because actually the, the da'wah that I find is very seems to be Muslims follow that which is popular and that which is popular in today's time is you know philosophy and atheist attacking atheist problems modernism secularism but they're not going back to the traditional aspect which is actually learning that the different qara'as and, and the actual information is going to benefit people out there because all the acts that's happening today that I've been seeing is basically on this subject the qara'as and how to establish that this is actually authentic and most of the responses that I've been seeing out there is not very consistent. It's, it's all over the place. And the Muslim da'iyas are not really educated about the specific aspect about Islam. So on this, I would fundamentally disagree. Brother Farid, Brother Mansur, and myself, we've published many things that covers this topic. And in fact, tomorrow, um, the I3 Institute here in Canada, we're doing a free two-day weekend boot camp on the Qira'at and the Ahruf and the historical transmission of the Qur'an. We'll be looking at Qur'anic Masahif. We'll be looking at uh, textual criticism, form criticism, source criticism. We'll be looking at the arguments of the Orientalists, what the modern scholars say, what they argue, how they argue. We'll look at stomatology, phylogenetics. It might be a little bit complicated, but the point is we are addressing this need. Uh, if you go on uh, Brother Farid's academia.edu page, we've published a couple of documents uh, documents together with Brother Mansur from uh, Dawa Wise, which is a fantastic channel. And I think even on Dawa Wise, Brother Mansur has done a couple of lectures on this topic as well. So it is being addressed. You just need to go to the right sources, inshallah. And uh, Brother, uh, what's his name? Uh, Hamza, sorry. I, I should know your name, shouldn't it? It's been a few years. Let me just, uh, if I can just share my screen temporarily, Brother Hamza. Um, yeah. Everyone is welcomed. We have more than 300 signees for the event tomorrow. 300. Our brother Hashimo, there we go. A very handsome picture, if you remember that picture, Hashimo, right? Um, that was from our day trip. Yeah, that was our day trip to London, if you remember, with uh, Hamza. And I think we got you look about 12. <laughs> this was only like two years ago. So it's absolutely free. It doesn't cost a dollar. It doesn't cost a cent. You just turn up. And we're doing it again next weekend for the people that live in Europe and Asia. We're shifting the time so everyone can join, not a single cent. So, brother, I believe that we are addressing the question as best as possible. In other in words, anyone in the UK watching Liverpool, Man United, it's on the following weekend. But why would you do that? Why would you watch that? It's such a stupid timing in the UK. It's the best it's timing because we, we alienate all the extremists like you. Hello. Salam alaikum, bro. C could I just say something to Brother Daniel? Because I, I, he could probably hear us. But Hamza, on the last Dawa clinic, did I not mention the always be closing <laughs> from Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross? And then in this video, he does the same thing. See, great minds think alike, right? Forget that Alec Baldwin killed two people, one person today. It doesn't matter, right? <laughs> quick question. What's your question? Yeah, hello. Make it quick. Make it quick. Make it, it will quick. be quick. It will be quick. First, of, first of all, barakallahu uh, Second of all, I just want to learn more about the seerah of the Prophet peace be upon him. 
And Sheikh Uthman yeah. ibn Farouk on his channel has a free Sira series. You can check it there, inshallah. One Message Foundation, or you can check it. What is uh, 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 what is uh, Masjid name again? Masjid Rabat. You can check it as a completely free Sira series with only authentic narrations within it. He validates and verifies every step of the way. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was quick. quick question, quick answer. Good. I like that guy. No, like my, Truth is with uh, an even quicker question. Whoa, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like him. Salam. Um, again. So my question is, um, what are good sources for philosophical arguments against the Trinity? If you guys have any, the Thought Adventure podcast. Yeah, oh, or Jake. Jake's Muslim metaphysician. Yeah, Jake is enough. Come across that one. One man band. All right. Have you, have you come across that one? Quick question. Quick answer. Woo. All right, he's gone. Doing well. Okay, I gotta ask Daniel: Is coffee only for closers? Let me see if he gets the reference. He gets the reference. Okay, good. Alhamdulillah. Um, okay, ex nihilist, what's the script? Uh, hello, hi, how's everyone? Assalamu alaikum. Sorry, this is the first time on uh, you know, live chat, so I huh? kind of panicked. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so my thing is like, I just wanted to share my story. So, um, I'm a Muslim, born Muslim, everything, but during some during my lifetime, I became a bit delusioned. So, you're still gonna that. share your story? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a short one. It's not a big one. So basically, I became a nihilist in a sense. I believed in God, but I was like, why am I being tested? And why? who asked me to be alive in the first place? So, and I wanted to kill myself. And I was like, uh, on the only reason which prevented me from killing myself was I don't want to go to hell. So, you know, it just was a confusing dilemma. Anyway, uh, then I came across a verse in the Quran and I'm I'm sorry, I was being ignorant. I never bothered that guidance is in Quran. If you read, you will find answers. And I just wanted to share that verse with everyone. I guess it might help. So it's Surah Ahzab, uh, ayat number 72. I'll try to read it. Are you going to read it? Yes. 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 We did offer the trust to the heavens and the earth and the mountains, but they refused to bear the burden and were afraid of it. And men picked it up and, and indeed he is unjust. So um, I saw some explanation of it and it meant that we chose to be tested in the first place. So that just made me an ex-nihilist then. MashaAllah. Okay. Nice to you, Jerry. That's all. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay. Thanks for sharing. It's quite interesting, you know, because people think that why would religion like um, say something like, uh, oh, you'll go to hell if you do this, you'll go to hell if you do that. This is an example where hell saved his life. Just the uh, mention no, of hell you. saved his life. Subhanallah, you know. MK Barudi. You meet it. Anyone? Anyone? Hey, uh, guys, for all the work you, you're doing. I'm a big fan and I follow all of you everywhere. Um, Should I be Allah afraid? Give us uh, steady fast on the Deen. Um, I currently don't have a question. I just uh, um, I'm just listening on. The... I thought that we got a stalker or something. What is you ever Yasin Muhajir. 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 Yasin Muhajir. Yes. Salam alaikum, Ikhwan. Salam alaikum. Yes, we can. We can hear. Okay, we can. I think everybody can hear you, bro. What's going? What's going on? Uh, yeah, just uh, first of all, uh, I'm, I'm I'm Moroccan. I live here in Germany. I just wanna. Uh, first of all, my English is my uh, third language, so uh, just don't mind the accent. Um, I just want to thank Brother uh, Daniel Hakakajou for all his work. Not He's uh, been a good help for me here in Germany with all those uh, Christian evangelists in the campus here in the university. They came, they start debating people and... I had, uh, like, two years ago, I had no basics in logic, in uh, apologetics. So, yeah, thank you, Brother Daniel, for all uh, 
or for, I really appreciate your, your your work. You have been really good help for me and for my friends. And uh, my second, re- it's, it's really a request. Can you please like uh, schedule a, a debate with the with the so-called Christian brands because he is so famous here in Germany. He has a big fandom here. They got all his books translated and all of that stuff. So, yeah, like if you don't mind, <laughs> <laughs> I think he minds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it has, Farid has responded uh, to everything, yeah. right? Yep. I mean, I just go to Farid and I uh, just have a, I learn something new and I have a good laugh. That's <laughs> best uh, place for entertainment about these uh, Christians. Yep. So just check out Farid responds. Uh, Christian so Prince YouTube channel. To completely. Yeah. All right, bro. All right. Yes. Yes. Okay. 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 Yes. Yeah. La Bas. Masalama. This is gonna keep going, isn't it? Malone. Yeah, isn't it a bad time for the guys in the UK? I mean, like it's like I think so. Malone, Malone, Malone. What's the score? It's Malone. Oh, did Malone. I miss one? Okay, okay. So I have a question to Sharif. So it's about morality, and uh, you, you talk about objective morality. I'm Are you over eighteen or under eighteen? Yeah, eighteen. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, you give me the answer away, mate. Uh-huh. Go on. Yeah. yeah, so it's about morality. So you talk about objective morality, but isn't it like impossible for objective morality to exist? Because how how can you like anchor everything in existence is subjective, including uh, like the creator? Are you Muslim? Yeah. I I do believe in objective morality, but. I'm not sure how you can okay. argue for it. And Are you Muslim? Yes. Okay. So do you believe Allah is a source of morality? Yes, but isn't... He calls that subjective. subjective. He calls that is subjective. that subjective or objective, that morality? Yeah. yeah, that's my question. How can you say objective morality exists when everything in existence is subjective? So isn't well, it What do you mean by subjective well, and objective? Okay, like, you know, like God uses his wisdom, his... Uh, knowledge to to uh, find out what's right and what's wrong and he's using his subjective like, it's like subjective though it's his subjective obviously like his subjective morality is better than my subjective morality because he can like god can like is wiser and like you think god's morality is subjective yeah yeah I, I, i'm asking how can morality be objective if like, yeah but uh mulamun mulamun is that how you pronounce yeah. your name, sorry? Yeah, Mula so, Moon. Uh, Mula Moon. So, Mula Moon, so I'm just trying to understand. Uh, you're saying everything that we perceive is subjective or everything that we know is subjective. Yeah. So, again, I, want to, I just want to understand what you mean by subjective. Not what you mean by subjective morality, just what you mean by subjective. Like, okay, so, uh, subjective, so... Like, okay, so imagine colors, right? I see, I look at a fence and I see it as blue. And okay. somebody else uh, sees the same fence, but they see it as orange. And like, and there's no objective color for the fence because everything in existence will look at the fence using their... What's the color of fence have to do with morality? <laughs> it's an analogy. It's an analogy. Yeah, the question was just about subjective. That's yeah. he was responding to that. So, so, is this, yeah. So yeah, look, and, when you yeah, when you look at morality, when you look at morality, you you really it's not really the distinction subjective objective is not really a good distinction. The distinction really should be realist and anti-realist. So what we mean by that is, uh, does object or does morality exist? Are we realist about it? Like, does numbers exist? Are we realist about it, or are we anti-realist? Is it just language? We just call this morally good and call this morally bad so we need to understand whether we're realist or anti-realist as opposed to subjective or objective because you could argue that you know subjective meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who decides what's good and bad yeah divine command theory whatever however you want to uh, provide it but you can still be realist about it because you can say it's grounded in God as an example yeah Um, but that's a separate discussion to talking about 
uh, you know, the general idea of subjectivity, yeah? Because subjectivity is a general idea, is basically saying that there are no mind-independent facts about the world, yeah? There are no true statements which are mind-independent. I don't think you're saying that, are you? You're not saying that there are no mind-independent true statements. Our perceptions may be perceived by, you know, ourselves as a subject, but there are, we do believe there are mind-independent true facts. Uh, I mean, how do you prove that, though? Give me well, an example. Well, do you believe, okay, mm -hmm. do you believe that the internal angles of a triangle on a flat surface adds up to 180 degrees? Based on my subjective knowledge and... Yes. Yeah, but it's not so. It's not going to change, though, is it? <laughs> He's not going to be turning around and saying, "Well, based upon me, I believe it's 180 degrees." It's not this. This mathematical truths, like the internal angles of a triangle, they're not. It's not like okay, me col it's perceiving color red thing. and you perceiving color red. It's yeah, just a, a true statement. Thing. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm um, specifically talk about morality. It's not a, yeah, so so that's what I'm saying. The morality, the better argue, better question to ask is, are you realist or anti-realist? Meaning, do you believe that these things that we call morally good, morally bad, they actually have some sort of ontology, some sort of existence? Or do you believe that they're just names that we just give to things? Yeah? That's the question yeah, that you want to have. Yeah, like a triangle, it does exist external to me, but morality, like the act of committing theft i can't like measure it independent of my subjective like uh well there's look there's the... yeah so it's a good question uh i think yeah on thought adventure podcast we'll, we'll we'll address this particular topic i think recently we had the discussion on this anyway but just to give you a very basic brief way of looking at this is uh one way of looking at this is as human beings we have this fitra innate nature and this innate nature seeks out morally good acts. Yeah. Now, obviously, if we've established that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the cause and the creator of all things that exist, all contingent, limited, dependent beings like ourselves, like human beings, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that places and creates and proportions the attributes of these things that he created, then the fact that we have this desire to do morally good acts, yeah, or be moral beings then that is an attribute that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created. Now, how do we know what's morally good and morally bad? Well, you know, ultimately, we have to go back to what the Qur'an says, yeah? So even if we want to say and take a position like, we generally know what's morally good and morally bad because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given that, has that ability, so not lying is morally bad and, you know, and uh, being truthful is morally good, and then it's qualified by the text, which is one position within the Islamic theology. Another position would simply be is that, well, we have this desire and to understand how to be morally good about, we submit to what the Quran and the Sunnah says. So, yeah, and I don't see any problems in that. Uh, my main like uh, problem with that is like like God uses his like knowledge, like uh, his knowledge, his wisdom to. To basically his sub subjective, uh, sub yeah, we, we, uh, we as human beings are limited, finite, have less knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all wise, all knowledgeable, He's the creator of all things, and He's given us guidance. And He's told us this guidance is the best form of guidance. Talking about, you know, in that context, whether we should consider Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidance, quote unquote objective or subject it's irrelevant to be honest this is where philosophy I mean, becomes I mean, waste time. I mean Sorry. I wouldn't say irre irrelevant because like this is like a huge thing on judgment day you know okay like, brother people, I got yeah. a question for you can truth exist external to Allah uh, no no right so if Allah is the source of all truth then he is the most just and he is the all knowing yeah, we accept it wouldn't be subjective in that sense because when you use the word subjective, you mean to imply a finite sense of knowledge with the possibility of being wrong. And we're saying to you that whatever Allah has decided is the truth, full stop. It is morally anchored in an all-knowing just being. Uh, okay, but... Salam alaikum, bro. You know, it's, it's not going to stop going on. <laughs> Oh, you're muted, Daniel. 
Wait, well, before we go to the next one, um, one thing that this guy mentioned and the guy, that Trevor guy also said, they make these statements that are self-contradictory. Like, can't, if you say that um, there is no objective morality or there are no objective truths, that statement itself is being declared as an objective universal claim. So that, it does not refute the statement itself. It's like saying, this sentence is a lie. This sentence is a lie. It's self-refuting. Or like, it's. I, I get stuck whenever they start talking about objective versus objective morality. And they, they're subjectivists, but they start making these very universal objective claims about what is true or not about the world, about the universe. Like, I can't like get past that. Yeah, yeah. self-defeating. Yeah, self-defeating. It just demoralizes me when Muslims come with these kind of questions. Say. But you know, there are, uh, we have to accept there are people out there who are confused about these things. So yeah. sometimes it's good to just point it out to them, you know. Yeah, I, I don't mind that. We have three hours yeah. and 34 minutes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we we will address this topic on our, on the Thought Adventure podcast. Yeah, inshallah, we, yeah, we will get will do that. Exactly. As if Yusuf man is good at that. Assalamu alaikum, brothers. Wa alaikum salam. Wa alaikum salam. Is it okay if I ask a question related to hadith? Uh, because there are a few atheist ex-Muslims, they're going bonkers over this hadith, like they got a killer argument against Islam. So the hadith is. Uh, it's from Sahih Muslim, and the reference is Book 3, Hadith 30. Okay, give you the summary. Uh, it's about the embryology. Uh, it says the reproductive substance of a man is white. I mean, this was touched upon yesterday. I got the answer, but then they presented this. Is this you again? Well, we, ad we addressed it yesterday. I'm not going to waste our time with you, mate. Who is that? Someone you know? <laughs> Someone came onto the um, stream yesterday, and he asked the same oh. question, and the doctor gave him a beautiful response. Um, and then he claimed he was a medical student but didn't know how solids are moved in the body with, with liquids. Oh, this kid, I remember now. Yeah. Honestly. Great commission. I believe you're a Christian. Strutting Hello. around. What's going on? Hello. Hello? I can't hear you. Just sit down. Can you hear me? Feel like... Yeah, just yeah. sit yeah. still. Just sit still, still so we can get a proper connection. Get dizzy. Oh, no, there's... Oh man, you, you got All a right. great commission, but not a great connection. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Sorry, let's just get someone else. All right, yeah, yeah, Ahmed. Yeah, it's me again from yesterday from the uh, EF uh, EF Dawa. But I just wanted to clarify something. That's all. I was I was gonna say I wasn't arguing with you guys about the uh, the ayat from Maida. I didn't make any statement like Chapter that. Chapter five, verse fourteen. Yes, you were yes. just nervous. I, I yeah, just we got it. To it. That's all it. I wanted to say. Well, like all right, dude. take care, bro. Sorry for. It's John Snow again. Salam bro. Oh, no, Salam alaikum. How are you doing? Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, you saw these Muslims coming on. What's going on, bro? We still can't hear you. You need to speak up. He's not speaking as yet. Is he, is he muted? He's speaking. Hi, He's can muted. you hear me? Yeah, yeah now we can. Yeah. Am I muted? No, you can speak. Oh, you can hear me okay? Yep, go right ahead. Hi. Hi. My, my question is regarding the Bible teaching the second exodus that's come. I want to know what your guys' thought of that is. You just broke up. Can you repeat that again? My question is regarding the Bible, it teaches the second exodus that's coming at the end of days uh, okay. of the 12 tribes of Israel. I wanted to know what you brothers think of that. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't have a point of view. So, um. What about the 12 tribes of Israel? What is your question about He's the 12 tribes? That there's a second exodus mentioned in the Bible, right? which I really can't remember. Well, who, who really cares what's mentioned in the Bible? What is your point? Of, what, what is it you want to say about that well so if we look at jeremiah 16 verse 14 through 16 it states that a second exodus is coming 
not like a, so, not like the Exodus when they came out of Egypt, but a second Exodus from all the nations. Okay. Who cares what the Bible says? So, what are the thoughts of that? Who well, cares sure what the Bible a lot of says? People do across the world. Well, we don't. Well, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people do. No, we Muslims don't care what the Bible says. Well, a lot of people do. How about yeah, but we people? don't. <laughs> yeah, that's what we think about a verse in the Bible, as if you're quoting historical sources. Well, we don't believe we don't believe the Bible is historically reliable. We don't believe it contains any eyewitness testimony. We believe it's you know you say the four gospels, I say the four gossips. Yeah, it's just hearsay. My question would be, why do you believe what the Bible says? Because that's what I choose. Why though? Because that's what I choose. But why do you believe it's true? What makes you think the Bible is a reliable source of information? Because what I believe. No, but yeah, why? but you know, a, a Hindu will tell me I believe in the Ramayana. Do I need to believe that? I'm going to ask him, what is the evidence for that? And I'm going to use the same argument, no, or the, sorry, the same question for you as well. Everyone can choose to believe what they want to believe. And I choose to okay. believe this is true. And I okay. also believe that if you look at the book of Psalms, every single chapter of Psalms speaks of the second exodus. Now, why do you believe the Bible is true? Don't start because quoting from what it. I believe. Please don't, do don't believe? start reading from it as if you've validated <laughs> Please don't do that. Why do you believe it's true? Look, we, we, I, did not, I did not come on the stream to speak about the authenticity of the Bible or the Quran. I came on the stream to speak about the second exodus that the Bible teaches. No, you I, came on the stream. You came on the stream to ask us what we think about. If what's you don't want to discuss Bible, that. Uh, no, no, no. You come on the stream to ask us what we think about what's written in the Bible. And our response was very simple. We don't care what's written in the Bible. We don't believe it's reliable. Why do you? Yeah. Well, then that was your answer. You, you don't have no clue of the second exodus. No, why do you believe the Bible's reliable? Why do you believe it's historical? Why? What is it? What is it that convinces you? That's not what I. This mean. is your, bro. This is your salvation. This is your All salvation. All my comments were, was going with the second exodus. This is just the point to to avoid the question. Look, you asked the question. You might as well come on here and tell me what you think of Hanuman and the Monkey Simple. Army. If you can't answer it, then no, no, you, no, know. you might as well have done that. Do you then understand? You don't have to be on stream. No, you might as well come on here and say... No, we already, uh, you we already in, answered in you. Hinduism, we saw, uh, the it teaches that Ganesh it's, had his head cut off an and they couldn't thing. find it and they put an elephant head on it. What do you think about that? You might as well have come and asked me that question. We don't care what the Bible says. But I want to know why okay, you do. Okay, okay, listen. i not answer the question. You all are acting like a tune. Why do you believe that? Why do you believe that? She goes... <laughs> Obviously. ...around saying, hold in the narrative. That, but they're treating me the same way she treats you guys. Say that again. What? <laughs> she's she's talking about Hatun. To discuss the second <laughs> who's, she, who's she? Who's she? Who cares about Hatun, you know? I destroyed Hatun in two debates. Go check out yeah. my channel, EF Tower. Destroyed her on the idea that the Quran today is different to what Muhammad saw Salam had. Just go watch the debate. Smash it to bits. Exposed hypocrisy. So I'm not quite sure what you brought that to the table for. Why do you believe the Bible is a reliable source of Let's information? Speak about the second exodus. <laughs> He's still stuck. All right, bye bye, mate. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you he what. doesn't have anything to That's give not. us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, last guest. This guy's been waiting. Uh, hi. Assalamu alaikum. Oh, I, I was on the uh, previous stream of the Dawa Clinic yesterday. Oh, and uh, no. thank you for allowing me to come on again. Uh, I don't know if this point is ever brought up, but uh, you guys know Sheikh Uthman, and sometimes when Christians come to him, he brings out the Bible to show contradictions in it. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, some, he usually goes to the sometimes the Old Testament, like uh, Jehoiakim, whether he was eight years old or 18 years old, when he did evil in the sight of the Lord and mm-hmm. when he sent to the throne. And another person, I, I forget, where whether he was 22 or 42 when he ascended to the throne of Israel. But I've been reading the Bible more recently, and I've been trying to compare the the, the King James Version and the New International Version. And you guys know the New International Version you, takes away verses from the New Testament that are in the, the King James Version, right? And so um, I've been looking into the two versions, and what I have noticed, I looked at the Jehoiakim again, and so like in the King James, there is a contradiction, like whether he was 8 or 18, but the, but the New International Version corrects the error because so in the new international version it's no longer in one i i I can't remember the other where it said he was eight or 18 in the king james but here in the niv both instances jehoiakim's age is 18 and in the other case of the the other prophet i can't the other king of israel i can't remember right now it's i think it was either the correct answer he's 42 and it's changed that as well and there's also in a Second Samuel chapter twenty-four. Brother, instead of yeah. giving more examples, it might be more prudent to get to the point of what do you think the Sheikh has done wrong? No, no, I, I'm not saying he's done anything wrong, but I, I'm saying that it's uh, you because Christians come to you guys saying that the Bible is a, ri- a reliable source of information, and I maybe I think this point isn't used up. Like I would say, not only does the New International Version take away from the New Testament that is in the KJV, it is correcting the KJV as well. Sure. My brother, my brother, seriously, you've come on to tell us this. Have, have you not seen our Bible streams on um, EF Tower? I have, but those are focusing right. on the New Testament. I'm talking about the Old Testament. Right. Uh, thank you for the information, brother. Jazakallah khairan. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum uh, salam. Yeah, I really didn't know. Was there a point to that? <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> This always happens when we allow Muslims on at the end. Anyway, guys, um, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for coming. Sorry the caliber of guests wasn't that brilliant, Daniel. I hope you'll join us again, inshallah. Um, inshallah. Honestly, inshallah. I'm really back. sure I'm going to get a backlash from your slave flex, but, you know, it's where it is. Thanks for joining. <laughs> Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam to you right So, oh, before you go, um, so if anyone, obviously, all, all your fanboys are here, isn't it, mashallah? So, uh, Daniel Kikachu, his channel is The Muslim Skeptic. Is that right? Yes, sir. Alhamdulillah. So the, the link is in the uh, description. So go check out his channel. Go subscribe, share his stuff, quality material. Okay, bro. Assalamu alaikum. Take care, dude. I want to start to lie right now. Brother Sharif, mashallah, from the Thought Adventure podcast. What a show that is, mashallah. Anything great coming up? <laughs> yeah, inshallah, we've got uh, Brother Abdurrahman who's going to be doing releasing a course on consciousness. Uh, breaking it down uh, and talking about how materialism cannot solve this problem. So, inshallah, that'd be really good. It's one of the key arguments that really, if you if you understand it and explain it to a person who's a materialist, he will not be able to be a materialist any longer. Not to be missed then, mashallah. Okay, my brother, Jazakallah khair once more for joining. Loved your responses. See you next time. Take care, dude. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Brother Ijaz the Trini. MashaAllah, tell everybody about your beautiful project tomorrow and Sunday. Of course, Saturday and Sunday, completely free. 12 uh, p.m. Eastern Standard Time to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The best time possible. Best time possible. Give us UK times. Right. Uh, My final word, London is blue. Uh, Manchester United sucks. Salam alaikum. (laughs) What time (laughs) in the UK? He didn't answer that. (laughs) (laughs) Do you know what time it is in the UK? What time in the UK, mate? 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. Come on, bro. I know that's like the back of my hand. What are you talking about? Alhamdulillah. We'll say it then. Alhamdulillah. Don't forget calling Christians. Check out his channel. Next level. Um, and last but not means, means least, Mother Brother Hashim from Dawa Wise. You in Speaker's Corner Sunday? Yeah, inshallah. Um, when are you guys back? We're joining you the week after, inshallah. Okay. Inshallah. Yeah, that'll be great. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Great. That's going to be good. So hopefully the full tribe is coming down, I think. EF Dawa. Inshallah. Yeah, that'd be fantastic, inshallah. All yeah, right, so obvious so, as always, um, my brother Hashim's channel, dawawise.com, yeah. is in the link. Just go check out their stuff. They always have a brilliant we guest. We've got uh, a new Arabic channel, and also very soon we're going to have a Nusantara or Malay Indonesian channel. So check out the links on dawawise.com. 
<laughs> that's all right. I'll tell you what, I have to get Turkish subtitles, man, because oh, after going to Turkey, subhanAllah, yeah. spread the word. All right, my sure. man. Salam alaikum. See you well, next time. Now, after the record. Okay, and that just leaves me. Apologize, my stupid uh, camera was doing that kind of strobe flex. I don't know why. I need to fix it. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining, being in the chat, sharing what we're doing. Um, we had some guests were all right. We uh, we have got some nice material going, so alhamdulillah. Um, it was nice to have some Muslims on at the end as well with their flexes, because they always bring a weird flex, but alhamdulillah. Uh, has just joined. Hey, welcome. Salam alaikum. Looking very serious there, Mr. Subhan Shah. All right. Um, yep, that was it. Arena's over. Three hours, 49. Not bad, considering we've scraped the barrel on some of them guests. Um, when am I back? I'm back on Sunday with my usual Sunday relaxed flex. So that's uh, a live where I just chat to you guys. We go through the comments and try to make a show out of what you guys say. So, um, yeah, bring on Daniel again. Yeah, mashallah. Very good. You know, um, we need to start spreading the... I need to start putting the thumbnails up early so you get to, guys get time to share it everywhere and bait the Christians and bait the atheists, inshallah. I tried doing some baiting on TikTok today. Um, it might be an idea next time to have TikTok streaming as well or something like that while we're doing it. Um, yeah, that's that. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. You know what's coming.